right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. It's Friday, which means we made it uh, through the week. Well, you guys made it through your weeks. I made it through my week. My week was a week of experimenting, uh, seeing what it would be like to do a daily broadcast. Monday through Friday, we were here, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. The goal was also to show a tour diary at the end of every episode. So what we would do is I'd be here live like I am now, and then right after we'd all go watch the premiere of My Life on the Road from the Monsters, uh, excuse me, from the 80s cruise. I was jumping uh, jumping ahead. Um, but there are so many copyright problems with tonight's episode that you may have to uh, uh, go on hold for just a minute. There's just so many uh, uh, things. But uh, that doesn't matter. We'll have time to watch it. But the good news is that Matt Thorne is here, uh, 80s pop culture icon uh, and enthusiast Matt Thorne. You know him from the band Rough Cut, Jailhouse, original uh, bass player and Rat, first member to ever, uh, first bass player to ever to record with Rat on the Metal Massacre album. So he's going to join us. We're going to have lots of fun. We're going to take your calls. Uh, <laughs> no, no one's going to call. We'll take your questions uh, and more right after this. All right, here he is, Matt Thorne. How are you, Matt? Good, bud. How are you doing? Good. Last time I saw you, we were in uh, Aruba. Yeah. It was nice weather there, huh? It was nice. I didn't yeah. expect it. I thought it was going to be that humidity that you experience in like Cancun, and these tropical places, but no, it was nice. A yeah, little windy I, I, on the boat. Before we talk too much about the cruise in Aruba, a lot of people have been concerned that maybe I'm maturing and growing up. I want you to know that that is not the case. Last night, I went to see a movie called Rad from 1986 in the theater. Mm. Uh, and while I was there, I happened to get uh, uh, this cup, which is for Ghostbusters uh, Slurpees. Uh, I don't need this, but I had to buy it. And you know, I, it was very expensive, but I got it. And then I thought, well, while I was at it, I would get, this is called a vessel. <laughs> this is a Slimer popcorn vessel. And uh, you, you can fill the popcorn in him, in him and then eat it. But I, uh, I didn't uh, want to uh, dirty up the, the popcorn vessel. So what you, for a few extra dollars, they'll give you a separate serving of popcorn. Uh. And then you can take this home uh, in its... Uh, uh, what do you think a thing like this costs? Um, With a large popcorn. I mean, I wouldn't pay more than two bucks, but I, I would imagine it cost about 50. 27 and change with the popcorn. Okay. Uh, popcorn's very expensive. After the movie, I, I wanted to prove that I haven't grown up. They have those claw machines. Remember those games in the arcade? Oh, wow. I, and I want a plush uh, a Slimer. You know what I've noticed is that there's a lot of drippy stuff happening from that guy's well, teeth. Yeah. Your, your cup. There's yeah. there's it's there's it's some gooey green. stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And that's Bill Murray, a better hairline than Bill Murray, but that's Peter or any Banks. of us. Or any <laughs> of us. <laughs> True. Um, anyway, so uh, so the just to make sure everyone knows, I have not uh, grown up uh, even remotely, and I'm like. I'm I'm on two packs a day of these bubblegum cigarettes. I can't quit. Oh shit. <laughs> okay. Now, did have you ever had a Michelada? I don't think you have. Oh no, I think I have. Uh like beer like, and tomato juice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they put this stuff around the edge. I I Jimmy Tray or I can't remember what it's called. And it's the same gooey stuff that you have on the side of your cup there, but yeah. it's, you can eat it. And it's like kind of sweet, and it it's it, but it's red. Yeah. Have you, had, no, have you seen this? Same yeah, kind yeah, of, of course, look. Yeah. Same look. In uh, New York, when I was growing up, they would use Clamato tomato juice and mix it with Budweiser. It was a little cheap. Yeah, it's that it's that that same kind of idea. But they put this they put this stuff around the edge, and it's got that gooey stuff, and mm -hmm. and if but it's red. People who've been watching the series on the boat they saw the night that the, you were just trying to have a nice ipa yeah and 
they gave you an uh, AMF. Yeah, which uh, Michelle explained was an yeah. audio smother effort. And I, it sounded to me like after you drink it, you're pretty much done for the night. It just, by like the name it. just by the name of it. Yeah, it, it didn't look like healthy. No. Uh, but so they, they traded in. So, uh, yeah. So last time I saw you, uh, it was in yesterday's episode or two days ago. It, it's all a blur. You were getting off the boat. You and your lovely wife and Stephen and his lovely fiance, you guys spent a night in Aruba. You guys were like Lucy and Ricky with Ethel and Fred. Yeah. Uh, Ramel kind of led the way because uh, she set up this ride that was like this. I, I mean, it was a nice ride. And they took us to our hotel, our resort. And um, Stephen, he, I think he was pretty pleased. He just jumped out of that, that off that ship and got in this like Cadillac looking SUV. And then um, we ended up at the resort, which was a really nice resort. And we sat there for probably an hour, and it's, there was finally a room ready. And I, we, uh, Ramel and I gave that to Stephen and, and Christy to go to. They went up there. We stayed for another couple hours. They eventually, well, Christy came down and joined us at the beach. We had palapas. I didn't know what those were, but they're these grass umbrellas. And I don't think anybody knew what they were until we. Your wife. Your wife knew she studies before a trip and she, she didn't know, but I don't think she knew like three weeks ago what a palapa was. Right. And I thought it was some kind of like food, but it's not. It's, a, it's like an umbrella with grass on top and you sit underneath these things so you don't get skin cancer. Right. Um, right. Which you and I have both had. Yeah, yeah. All three of us have had this. And your wife so, as well, yeah. Yeah. So um, Christy came down and joined us and um, – eventually convinced Stephen to come down and join us join us and then on his way down there i think he he met some parrots that they had kept outside and um he was taking video of the parrots he finally joined us at the beach and then we went in the water and this time he had his shorts because i don't last time he just wore his stage pants i think he had water. his stage no, pants yeah. yeah so this time he had shorts he we actually went in the war and he, he he said it was a little salty for his for his taste so, and then Christy was in fear of great white and tiger sharks and all these different uh, sharks that eat you. So they you didn't, didn't go in very deep. deep. I didn't see any, I, didn't, I haven't really heard of too many people getting eaten by sharks in Aruba. I think people have been murdered there, but mm -hmm. nobody's been, nobody's really been eaten by a shark. So they avoided the depth. Ramel was going out to the buoys. I don't know. Where, she always does this to me. And I think she, you know, I'm, she could get eaten by a shark. If she continues this behavior, going out uh, six hundred yards to the buoys, but um, the water was calm, and uh, those guys didn't spend much time in the water. They swam a little bit, and then they got out before the shark got them. And then uh, they we talked a little bit, and then Stephen went back to his room, and I, I didn't really see them again. Oh wait, I saw Christy the next day, but I didn't see Stephen again. They usually uh, stay to themselves, and Stephen doesn't like to go out very much. He no. some, he entertains himself. He doesn't need anything. Did no. you guys all fly home together? No, they flew home earlier than us, um, so they had to get out of there. Uh, yeah, I think about twelve, and then they split and went to the airport. So they got home. They left a little earlier than us, like a couple hours. And I didn't see them anywhere. They were nowhere to be seen at the airport or anything. So, no. Yeah. Uh, how was the airport in Aruba? The, the exiting, it was, it was, it was weird. Yeah, it, some people you, in our organization were very confused, perplexed even. Well, it, it's not, it's not something you're used to, and it feels like it's never going to end. Like right. you're in a different area, and you're just following other people, and you never really get explained. Nobody tells you this is what's going on. You just kind of follow. The rest and you go outside for a bit you wait in a line and then in, underneath some covered roofing and then they you walk with some people when they say it's okay and you go outside for about a hundred yards and you come in another section and then you you stand there and somebody calls you forward and they take your bags and then you you think you're done and then you go outside again and you wait in some covered roofing and then you go in another place and then you wait, you're underneath this thing. And then all of a sudden your bags appear and then you pick your bags up and then you go with your bags and you follow up people again. Cause you never know what you're doing. 
You just follow people. And then all of a sudden you notice people putting their bags on this conveyor belt and you put your bags on there and everybody's in a big rush to put on that conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. They're so over it. Right. So everybody's fighting over this to get their bag on there when you really don't need to, because you still got another 20 feet to wait in line. And they'll Dr. pick Paul is out. here, uh, Matt. Oh, Dr. Paul. Your, your, your former lead vocalist. Uh, 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 yeah, one of those, what did he say? He wants to, he wanted to know if you had a key party while you were there. That's uh, where you and your wife put your keys in a bowl with other people's keys. And then you see who you end up with. These are interesting. No, <laughs> but those are interesting. How do people do? Have you heard of this game? Uh, yes, but I mean, from watching movies and things about the seventies, I never, I never, never you played. Never you never uh, When we got on the cruise, I told Michelle maybe we should put a pineapple on our door. I was joking, and then yeah. I looked around at some of the people on the boat, and I told her take the pineapple down. You know, uh, it wasn't you, always the prettiest crowd. Did you notice our floor didn't have much decorations? Like there, if you went to other floors, there was decorations on doors and people's pictures and signings and our our hallway of rooms there was a bubble gum place you get some bazooka gum from but that was a there was a bit and a, and a few but it wasn't as it wasn't as celebratory as the others you were on oh, two I, you were on two i was on three uh my floor wasn't great i didn't even go down to your floor and you then know, you wouldn't want to <laughs> right it was the slums the yeah. upstairs though uh, yesterday on my video, we showed it. Michelle and I went trick or treating essentially, and oh. boy, did people go over the top um, with, the, with the stuff that we brought home. Wow! Uh, did question you for you, Matt. Uh, where the hell is Mark's question? He asked. Uh, you think I'd be more prepared? But he, uh -huh. he asked how you got involved with some band. Uh, hold on, I never heard of it. Platinum Overdose. Oh, uh, okay. well, Lance, um, Lance, yeah, Lance is a good friend of mine and he had a record company and I used to master records from, for him. He also used to come to my studio and, um, at one point he goes, I want to start this band called platinum overdose and you can play guitar. And I thought I'll be in a band. I mean, we never played out. I just basically played guitar and produced it and mixed it and gave it back to Lance. But it was fun to play guitar. So that's why I did it. Yeah, well, Mark is a fan of it. Uh, Matt, as uh, you you know, people who watch the show, they're big fans of seeing what pop culture you know and what you don't know. Mm. And, uh, it, and it seems like you were busy playing uh, arenas and stadiums and making records and living that maybe you weren't sitting around watching Nick at Night, such as someone like myself. Yeah, I did. I, I never watched a lot of TV. I did watch some stupid TV in the last, I'm going to say, 15 years, which is mainly reality TV. Like, And I've watched, I admit, I've watched uh, Vanderpump Rules. I admit I've watched um, Summer House. I, have, I admit I've watched uh, American Idol. Um, and you know, these are looked down upon a lot of these shows and, and I, and, and I'm going to say I I'm entertained sometimes most of the time. Now I don't really like farmer's wife or farmer wants a wife. I guess that, that would, that's how I don't say. even know some of these, uh, oh, yeah, no. they're, they're, but, they're uh, available. But I <laughs> thought that people, Matt, people would like to see you, uh, take a quiz. Okay. And so I prepared a quiz. It's called. How well do you know 80s pop culture? Okay. okay. Oh, that's fun. And uh, so we're going to take this quiz and uh, I'm going to ask the questions. You will mm -hmm. give your best answers. Uh, if we have to, we can make it multiple choice. But I think some of these are uh, relative, relatively, I can't say that word, easy. Simple. But okay, here yeah. we go. Yeah. Question number one, and you guys can wager at home, but don't give the answers. Uh, which smash hit TV show of the 1980s starred a character named Hawkeye? Uh, if you don't know, I can go to multiple choice. Uh, was Rudger Hauer in it? No. Okay. Okay, let's um, go to multiple choice. A, okay. the Jeffersons, B, MASH, or C, Dallas? 
I'm going to say mash. Mash would be correct. Okay. Okay. So you're you're on the board one for one. Okay. Which 1985 blockbuster movie was all about a time machine built into a car? Uh, the the one with the kit in it, <laughs> the black car, the Camaro. The, oh, what's his head? No, for let me give, let me make it multiple choice for you. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, maybe what if I told you the car is a DeLorean? Uh, Back to the Future. Back to the Future. All right. Uh, here we go. Norm was a character in which major TV hit? Uh, Seinfeld. <laughs> we we actually Seinfeld? went at, we actually visited this place and I. Uh oh! Uh, cheers. Cheers, correct. <laughs> All right. Now, here's some, here's some, a uh, little bit, mix it up a little bit. What renowned Sony product became famous in the 80s? Was it the portable eight track player, the CD player, or the portable cassette player? I would say the Walkman, none. Or portable I, you, CD. You know player. what? I don't have the answer to this one, but I think... I'm going to say the Walkman. Now, the Walkman guy was recorded in my studio. He got paid fifty million dollars by Sony to give him the rights to the Walkman for the invented. technology. Yes. So I crazy? think the answer is portable cassette player. That would be a Walkman, which we both saw. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. In the nineteen eighties, Betty White was the star of which TV show? Hollywood Squares. That's Hollywood a trick Squares. question. Let me make this. Let me make it multiple oh, yeah. choice for you. Magnum mm. P.I., Knight Rider, or the Golden Girls? I'm going to say Golden Girls. That would be correct. Knight Rider was the one I was trying to, the one I guessed on the, the DeLorean one. All right, here's a good one. Now, this yeah. one's going to be a fill in the blank. Okay. Complete this, complete this public service announcement. This is your blank on drugs. This was a brain. very famous TV brain? commercial. Brain? They were, brain. Brain is correct. This is your brain yeah. on drugs. It was a commercial where they uh, uh, they were mixing a fr uh, fried eggs in a pan, and they warned mm -hmm. us of the dangers. Nancy Reagan said, just say no. I was actually pretty frightened as a young person. I thought that if I did drugs, my brain would actually turn Me into too. those it eggs. It was the one with the egg, right? The egg. They were frying the egg, I believe. Uh, Yes, they were frying an egg. I don't even know the answer to this one, but I don't think you're going to either. In 1980, which baseball team won their first World Series for the first time? 1980. Uh, I'm going to say uh, the Braves. I have no idea. Well, the Mets. I don't know. Might I, I have no might. idea. Hold on. I'm going to look this one up. You might be right. It says Yankees, which I know is not correct. Uh it looks like it was the Philadelphia Phillies. Oh. The, yeah, the choices were Braves, Yankees, Phillies. At least you got one of the choices. All right. All right. Here's, a, here's a good one. Okay. Uh, and Michelle demonstrated this on one of the episodes of the show. What type of bracelets were crazy popular with the kids in the 80s? Something called pirate or pyrite bracelets, slap bracelets, or emerald bracelets? Well, I'm going to go for the uh, pyrite bracelet because pyrite is fool's gold, right? <laughs> I think it's the slap bracelet. Okay. I don't see the answer, but I think and only because we got them in the hallways, and, and that's what I think. Although I thought that really in the 80s, people liked those those gummy bracelets or those black rubber ones. You know, Madonna used to have her whole arm uh, figured with them. A few people in the audience are playing along and knew uh, – uh, that metal guy knew Phillies and uh, yep. and Snap. But a lot of people are, are playing along at home. Uh, of course, there is no wagering, but uh, and some people are impressed that uh, Matt is doing so well. I'm a little impressed too. Uh, I, yeah. Now you you know the old way. The reason the pyrite bracelet was interesting to me because I think in the 1800s the old thing to test for gold was to bite it right, and you could tell if it was fool's gold which was pyrite or real gold if you if you could actually bend bend it or 
bite into it, right? It was soft, gold was soft, pyrite wasn't. So I think that's that's what I was thinking, you know, that'd be a good bracelet, a pyrite yeah. bracelet. No, no, I like that you explain your work. We could ask Dr. Paul, I think he was there in the 1800s, maybe he could oh, yeah. uh, en enlighten us. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get to the next question. Uh, in 1984, Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, and Bill Murray teamed up to fight blank in one of the best movies of the decade. Uh, was it was it Clint Eastwood hit too, where he fought the chimp? No, no, that would be uh, any which way but loose. Or, or, oh, uh, okay. No, well, I'd make it multiple choice. They teamed up okay. to fight communists, Republicans, or ghosts. Ghosts. Okay. What? was special about a toy named Teddy Ruxpin? Uh, uh, it, it was a teddy bear. That's partially I, right. Now, Matt, you don't, you've never had any children, right? No. Yeah, so then that's, at the time that things like Teddy Ruxpin came out, you were already recording records and probably not playing with it. Teddy Ruxpin was a teddy bear that you would stick a cassette in it, the back, close it up, and his eyes would open and he could read you books, basically. And it was really creepy. It, did it really work? I don't think it stayed on sync so much, but uh, yeah. but uh, they, they tried. It was sort of like early uh, Chucky. All right. Yeah. Bo, AI, and Bo and Luke Duke were the stars of which hit 80s TV show? Dukes at Hazard. Correct. Mm, Who wow. directed in 1984? Five movie called The Breakfast Club. This was also seen on the cruise. But I don't think you have a chance in hell. <laughs> uh, this is going to be it. I'm going to take a wild guess. Uh, um, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> well, if, <laughs> know if, we right. played, if we played multiple choice, the, Steven Spielberg, okay. George Lucas, or John Hughes? I'm going to say John Hughes. Yes. John Hughes okay. uh, invented what would be called the Brat Pack. And that yep. was movie. Which album did Michael Jackson release in 1982? It seems like a trick question because I thought bad? this record came out. Bad? No. <laughs> bad. bad came out after Thriller. So this is, oh, so Off the Wall? I think it's Thriller. I, it's got to be Thriller. Was it Thriller? I thought the thriller came out in 1984. To be honest, some people are saying well, that's what I came. thought. I thought thriller and all was that was later. But I, I would have thought off the wall. Uh, Denise thought off the wall. Uh, other people uh, said thriller. It's got to be thriller though, because bad came later. But uh, yeah, bad came later. That's true. Uh, but I think that what happened with thriller was it. It was like a. It built and built and built, you know what I mean? And so we had yeah. that record for years. And by the time, you know, Beat It, Billy Jean were out, by the time he got to the third, which was so insane, you know, it, it was uh, growing every day. So I think that's why we're used to it being later. It was just on the charts so long. Joe Montana was a star quarterback for which great NFL team in the 80s? 49ers. 49ers is correct. What was special about a 1988 movie called Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Uh, now let me give you multiple. Let me give you multiple choice. Uh, give me the multiple choice. It had surround sound. It had both live action and animation, or it was in 3D. It was both live action and animation. Correct. That is right. And uh, yeah, a few people are getting it. Uh, all right, uh, let's take a look and see. Oh, Matt, I think you're doing pretty damn good. Uh, Not bad, but you, I think you thought I'd do worse. I hoped. Uh, from 1985 to 1989, what was the most popular TV show in America? This one, I think, take the multiple choice. Uh, I, I'm going to guess it was... Okay. That was uh, what's I think name? you're going to get it. It's the it's the uh, gosh. I think um, you're. I think the you're guy you got it. arrested eventually. Bill the Cosby Show. You got it. Yeah, a guy you don't want to have a drink with. Yeah. No. Uh, allegedly, no. I think he was convicted. <laughs> okay, uh, Cosby Show. That was huge for those of you yeah. 
who were not around in the 1980s. Boy, the Cosby Show was insane. Thursday nights on NBC. Okay. Blank Shortcake was a popular children's doll in the 80s. Uh, was it, did she have red hair and strawberry shortcake? Strawberry shortcake. Here's one that, I mean, I'd have to look this up to be honest. I mean, I have a guess. Who was the NBA rookie of the year in 1980? Um, uh, Magic Johnson. You might be right. Are, are you? I'm just I, taking a guess. Well, the choices they gave were Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, or Michael Jordan. It seems too early, obviously, for Michael Jordan. Yeah. The answer was Larry Bird. What? I think you were on the wow. right track. Yeah, that's what wow. It that seems but too late. Right I thought he was a 70s guy. Yeah, I'm a little surprised by that one. Uh, all right, let's see what else we got here. And then we'll get to the audience uh, and some questions. Which news TV show was exceedingly popular in the 80s? This is a tricky one. But I'll give you the choices. Nightline, 48 hours, or 60 minutes? 60 minutes. I think 60 minutes. Which of the following was one of the stars of a funny show called Three's Company? Tom Cruise, Tom Selleck, or John Ritter? John Ritter. Yes. Which he uh, ended up he ended up dying early. He did. He had a aortic section. Yeah, very what sad. It? Huh. It's called an aortic dissection. It was a, it's oh, a, that's right, yeah. It's a heart he problem. Somewhere. Ron Jeremy uh, actually had it, uh, but went right to, he called somebody he knew who was a specialist. They got him right in the hospital and saved his life. John Ritter laid down for a while, didn't really know. Um, it's a hard thing to detect, but if you don't get it worked on right away, it doesn't You're seem done. like you do uh, a very good. Uh, so sad because John Ritter was so great. Uh, who authored a book that was turned into a movie called The Shining? Uh, 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 oh, oh, I know this one. I just can't remember his name. Um, uh, very popular writer. Um, writes scary stuff. He just actually had a movie out recently. Uh, can I get, get the multiple choice? Can I remember his name? Yes. Uh, Jack Kerouac, Daniel Steele, Danielle Steele, or Stephen King? Stephen King. In 1984, which pitcher debuted for the New York Mets? I know this one. Hmm. I'll give you a multiple um, choice. I, you're, you weren't a New Yorker, and I don't know how much baseball you're watching yeah. in 84, but Roger Clemens, Cy Young, or Dwight Gooden? Uh, I, I don't know this one. I'm going to guess Scotty Young, just because I, I don't know. Or <laughs> Dwight. Cy, Did I do Cy. Cy Young played in like 1908. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's not him, then. That's why he the award is named after him for pitchers. Still wouldn't no, be no. pitcher. Dwight, Who? Dwight Gooden, yeah. Oh, okay. Because Roger Clemens was a Red Sox, Dwight Gooden, who had a lot of drug uh, 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 issues. But a lot of people getting this one right were playing at home. We're, just sh we're, we're showing them. I'm giving them each imaginary uh, oh. points. You know, uh, Matt, since Wednesday has been a regular on the show, I've brought in a lot younger of an audience. Not that Wednesday is that much younger, but he appeals to a he younger appeals to the younger folks. He yeah. hasn't he hasn't hit his sixties yet. No. No, so, he, that he that he has not, but he is a grandfather. He he that's something he discusses. Oh, wow, he got started early. Wow. Mm -hmm. He got started that's hard early. To do. Yeah, it's hard to do at, uh, to get to be a grandfather. At, I'm not sure his age, but I would imagine he's mid 40s, late 40s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe he's in his uh, upper uh, 40s. The, all this stuff is on the internet. That you can uh, Google it. Although they do lie about his height on the internet. If he's watching, I apologize. <laughs> they, they definitely the internet is definitely exaggerating his height. Um, all right, let's see. Let's. Uh, Let's switch the, the line of questioning a little bit uh, to a video challenge. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see. Did you ever think that this is what you would be uh, doing? No, no, no. This is good times right here. I mean, I didn't even, you know, I don't think I've ever played these kind of games before. Maybe mm -hmm. when I was young, I had Scrabble or something like that, but no. Or Pictionary. <laughs> Pictionary. But that was different. You just had to guess people's pictures. 
99% okay. of people cannot name uh, these totally tubular images of the 1980s. Here is the first image. Uh, what movie is pictured here? Um, uh, E.T. That is correct. All right, let's see what what's next. You didn't need multiple choice. All right. Okay. What? Yeah. 80s music video is pictured here. Thriller. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, let's go to the next one. And we've scrolled past these advertisements. What 80s movie is pictured here? Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. How about here? Can you see that? Yeah, Terminator. Terminator is right. See, Matt knows stuff. I'm starting to think. I'm starting to think. Okay, what TV show is that? Uh, 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 uh the one with Tamela Anderson. What was that? What was no, it? no. Okay. You're thinking Baywatch. Yeah, I'm thinking Baywatch. No, and that's only no. because he has red on. That's the this only reason. You could see that. I couldn't even tell. Yeah. Uh, um, this is a term that people use all the time when they have to fix something. If you have to make a quick change to your pedals or fix some cables or do something, even in the studio, they probably use this term, the name of the show. I don't, I have no idea. But I it's, will tell you this, that yeah. Southern people, when they're about to do something, they fix it. I don't know if you've heard this. Right. They're fixing to do this. So they're always repairing things. They they're don't know they're do repairing. They're fi I'm fixing to go to the store. I don't know why they have to fix anything when they're just going somewhere. You are completely correct of, on that fixing. Uh, but if you had to uh, make a last second repair yourself, but you didn't really know what you're doing, you would MacGyver it. Oh, I have heard this term. Okay, that's MacGyver. I had no, I didn't know what MacGyver looked like. Richard Dean Anderson, uh, MacGyver. Okay, which '80s movie is pictured here? One of my favorites. Wednesday's also. This is uh, Airplane Two. Well, it's or Airplane. Airplane. Okay, okay, Airplane. That's airplane. Airplane. Period. That's the autopilot right there. Yeah, right, I remember she had quite an incident on that, didn't she? She mm -hmm. she got into trouble. In yeah, Ju cockpit. Julie Haggerty. What '80s movie is pictured here? Cockpit, right? No pun intended. Say it again. It was the cockpit. She got in. She got. <laughs> she got in trouble in. Right? No pun intended. Yeah. I believe so. <laughs> okay. Name the movie. Uh, uh, oh, he was rich in this movie. Um, yeah, Michelle did not know was, the song "Party All the Time," which was an episode no. of Tour no, He Diary. came from. Another country, and he, I, I know the whole story, but I, why can't I remember the movie? What's the name of this movie? Well, you said he came from somewhere, so where was he going? To America, coming to America. Coming okay. to America, yeah. yeah. All right. Let's take a look here, see what else we got. All right, here's a good one, and maybe the audience will know. I feel like we should be betting. Audience, will, will Matt know who this is? Uh, I say no chance. I recognize her, but mm -hmm. you're right. No chance. Mm -hmm. she, she, uh, grew, she was a grown up. To, she ended up being another, an actress that was right. Not really. She didn't have a great grown up career. She oh, was, she in, she was huh. on a Sabrina, the teenage witch for a little while. Her, her breasts got so large as a teenager, she had to have them removed before uh, surgically before a lot of people did. But uh, uh, Maria was the first one with the correct answer. That is Punky Brewster. Oh, it is. I, I've heard, i never seen Punky. This is my first time I've laid eyes on Punky Brewster. Really? I'm shocked. No, I, I, I would have never known what she looks like. I don't even know what she did. What did, what did she do? So this is Soleil Moon Fry. That's the actress's mm -hmm. name. Okay. And Punky Brewster, her mother took her to the grocery store with her little dog, Brandon, who was named after Brandon Tartikoff, the president of NBC at the time. And mm -hmm. she left little Punky uh, as an orphan, basically. She orphaned her. Oh, she's an orphan? Okay. She showed up at this old man, Henry Warnemont's uh, uh, photo studio, 
and he eventually, a spoiler alert, gets custody of her. But it's a show uh -huh. about an old man saving a, a young orphan. Nowadays, that would probably be taboo, but uh, back then it was okay. There's some interest. What's behind her? Is that was she? Did she grow up in a, a um, in like New Mexico or something? She liked me uh, Chicago. She liked neon colors. And okay. she wore different sneakers. And when asked why did she have different color sneakers, she would say because she had different feet. Uh, somebody mentions, Am I Evil says it was the old dude from Police Academy. That is true. Uh, Commodore Lassard, uh, George Gaines played Henry. Okay. And, uh, How old do you think the old dude from this was? He's in the grave now. Uh, when he was on that show, he might have been in his upper 60s, early 70s, maybe. So I haven't met that. Yet. Okay. I was just wondering what her, her what constitutes an old man. But. Yeah. Well, no, but he looked old. Oh, you know, look. But, you know, that we're starting to find out that people like Archie Bunker were not nearly as old as we thought. Yeah. He looked like he was in his late 50s to early 60s didn't he see i but as a young person i thought this guy must be in his 70s 80s oh, really? yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that but you were correct he was in his uh, 50s but uh hold on uh, uh craig is here and craig has a comment hey guys much love from sydney australia matt has become an integral part of jason's waste some time videos keep on rocking mates uh hashtag burbank matt rocks by the Thank way, you, yeah. By the way, Matt's been here a long time, and we have not not once mentioned that. Thankfully, Wednesday told me he just got off a world tour and he got back to Burbank, and he said he was so happy to see that Matt's album, yeah, uh, back to Bunk Up. Burbank is Airport. It's the he saw it at the airport. Uh, the signs. Congratulations! It's number one on the instrumental bass charts. Uh, funk fusion and you can get this right now matt where do they go matt thorn dot shopify my shopify.com matt thorn dot my shopify.com i want to sell i want to sell one of these every things. time you say this I, I my shopify account goes on so i'm just it, it's amazing it's magic well so and i and it i like probably will go off in about a few minutes every time you mention it can can you hear it go off while we're doing the show I think so. We're going to find out. Now, usually it would go off immediately. So I'm a little disappointed at this point because it's been seconds. This, well, I'm sharing the link right now. The strength of this show to me has been that I've been able to uh, 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 appeal to people who buy products. I sold caseloads of Eddie Ojeda's Twisted Sister hot sauce. And, uh, and, and now... Uh, I like to think I had a small bit to do with the multi-platinum success of Matt's award-winning uh, Back to right. Funk Up CD. Now, which is better get his record out before your show gets picked up by NBC, and then you're not going to have any say what you can promote. Right. They're going to make me hawk a bunch of bullshit uh, yeah. uh, drum, drum records. Anyway, right. there's the link. So you go and you pick up a copy of the CD. Matt will sign it to you, right? Yeah. And uh, there's also uh, picks there. If you collect picks, yep. get one of those as well. I think it's the same shipping price, right? Yep. I'm waiting to get these really cool things, which um, they're called NFCs, NFC chips. They're like mini CDs. They're about this big. They're about the size of a quarter. And they come in a package about this big. And you just basically take the disc out. And you hold it to your phone and the whole album downloads into your phone and any yeah. videos that an artist has or anything like that, you can swipe through. So it's basically, you don't even, it doesn't have to be on Shopify. It doesn't have to be on Spotify or anything. It's just automatically downloads into your phone from this little mini CD. You just touch it to about this area on your phone. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, it's, it's a huge thing. The K-pop artists are going love it. Yeah, so I'm going to get a little one. I, I'm just waiting for them to be delivered. I don't know if this guy's ever going to get it together, but if I ever do. Thomas says, uh, by next week, the gold discs behind you will be for uh, one of your solo records. What are those records for behind you, Matt? Well, we have, let me see, we have The Eels, which is all the way there. This is a rat first 
uh, album out of the cellar. This is the Punisher CD, which was, I did a couple songs on there. And then over here that I hide because the reputation has kind of gone downhill, but it's trapped the first trapped record. Gotcha. It's behind the boxes. So yeah, for those of you who are wondering, uh, uh, Dr. Paul, uh, as, as somebody says that I need to use the same internet service as uh, Matt because I'm lagging. I think it's because of the 80s. Uh, a quiz is taking up all the bandwidth. I think it's moving maybe a little better now. I don't know. Uh, but uh, let's see. I mean, they didn't even have dial-up in the 80s. Matt has Burbank uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, it, 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 it's very, very elite. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Paul wants to tell a story. Story story time, he says. Okay, I uh, can see it. I'm looking at that. I skimmed past it to make sure it wasn't going to get you in trouble. I don't think it will. Matt, it's story time. Tell the wonderful people about the time Rock and Dave was driving the Winnebago and hit a deer in the venture you and Amir had getting to the next show. So um, David was always the designated driver. I think he liked to drive, and he thought he was the best driver, so... There was a certain point where we were taking these buses, but that got too expensive. So we basically uh, came into the Winnebago traveling and David was driving, I think it was through Rochester, New York. This guy, know, this guy's been here. I think he's Paul's friend. I think I know who he is. Anyway, um, we, we, um, David was talking and he didn't want, when he talked, he didn't pay attention to what was in front of him. He, did this man let me tell you a story so he was looking behind him and mr deer popped out and um he hit the deer so it destroyed the winnebago and so we we thought it would be a good idea to get out of the winnebago and go get the deer out of the road and so we got kind of close to the deer it was it was uh not a not a lovely smell to the deer so we ran back to the winnebago and we ended up getting out of there, but um, Amir and I, we, Ronnie liked us. So we were able to travel with Ronnie for the rest of the tour. Ronnie Ron James Dio. Yeah. We were able, Amir and I were able to travel with him. Um, David and Chris, I'm not sure how they were getting around for a while. Eventually, we all rented LTDs, or I, I think it's what you call them, these big looking cars that gas hogs and we drove those each, each of us had one we drive 20 hours across louisiana and texas and these things but um most of the th most of the rest of the tour amir traveled on that we got robbed a couple times um when we would get robbed when we would get rides with some other fans we got robbed um sort of the fans too the fans didn't rob us but somebody came up to us i think we went to go use a telephone once and we got robbed i i, I might have slept through that one but uh, supposedly we got robbed. The police showed up. But that's Paul about Shortino, it. Uh, Dr. Paul Shortino adds, you missed the deal bus and hitchhiked with girls that got held up at the gas station. That's so that what I'm yes, yeah, that's that's what happened. We got held up at the I didn't even, I forgot about that. We hitchhiked. I don't remember hitchhiking, but it's possible. We were desperate. We needed to get to the next place. Now, Paul, at this time, he was flying everywhere. I'm not sure how he was able to. We never flew. We I just, know how. I know how he was, but we can't say. <laughs> no, he was flying while we were driving, and he Paul, had a, think, he had a I connection. Think Paul would end up feeling a little guilty for flying, so he would do some drives that were crazy, like thirty hours. He would to make up for the fact that of the guilt, he would he would drive forever, and um, yeah. Doctor Paul has never stated. Uh, anything too private uh, i will say that much but no uh, uh, all right so i'm beating around the proverbial bush uh john doe has a question back for more is such an incredible song can matt tell us a little bit about the writing process so for those who don't know matt was in rat in 1981 some of his ideas ended up on Al rat albums later back for more is one of them so uh, tell us matt about that writing process i wrote it on my base which I, I will show you how I wrote it. I just sat there. And you're going to get a, a, a tutorial right now. I'm excited. This and um, I just went. Along. Let's 
That's what I did. We we all know that part uh, so well. So when you hear it, you think, wow, it's so catchy. But it had to start somewhere. And so yeah. did you write that on your own or in a room yeah. with people? I wrote it um, in the house on uh, in Van Nuys with Jake and Warren. We lived there. And Jake then I and went, Wendy Martini. Yeah. Right. I went to a rehearsal early one day at Mrs. O'Neill's house. And well, hold, hold on, Matt. I saw the name Mrs. O'Neill on the back of all the rat albums. And I, and I wondered who that was. It's a um, it was somebody Stephen knew a good friend. And she let Stephen stay in the back bedroom there at their house and outside a detached garage was a um like a rehearsal place all carpeted you know the old way where you just had a bunch of carpet on the walls and <clears throat> we used to rehearse in there but Stephen wouldn't Stephen would rehearse with sometimes but a lot of times he'd just be in the house so i went there early one day and i went in the house and i showed Stephen that part that's the only part i had and it was on bass and he wrote the whole song the rest of the song by himself. I mean, that was all I had. But he was really good at that. He was really good at putting things together, making things work. So he wrote that. Dun, 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 he wrote all that. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 this, he, Matt's told the story on this show a lot. It, it was strained out in time and uh, uh, and whatever. But uh, but yeah, and it, it, I, Matt didn't know that Rat was going to be a mm -mm. success and you had your own band and your own uh, uh, thing to follow at that time no one would have known well there was another band i was kind of in two bands at the time a band called sarge and, and rat and i was kind of flip-flopping back and forth i wasn't sure which one was going to be successful I, I, honestly i thought neither one would be successful but you know the 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 the, the sunset strip you'd have be, who had the popularity contest, the rat or the Sarge? And it would flip flop back and forth. So I, I, I was being kind of, and you know, ambivalent about which one I was going to pick. And um, I started to lean toward rat, but then Jake quit, who was one who was in my house. So I thought, oh, well, that was my friend. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go with Sarge. So that's what happened. But Stephen was very, he, he, nothing was going to stop him. So he went and got a whole new band the next day. And I think that, ex, that was because we were hanging out with Robin Crosby a lot. So he got Robin and Warren was living with us. So Warren just went in there and he was from San Diego. So it was a blessing from Stephen. And he was also friends with Robin. And then they got Kurt Meyer who was in Sarge also. And I want to say Gene Hunter, maybe, mm -hmm. who was a graphic artist. And that was Jake's old bass player, T.M. Teaser from San Diego. Didn't you try out for Dawkins as well? I was I, I was asked to, but there was a uh, interesting conversation I was having with somebody in Dokken, and it didn't they were going to get rid of the main guy, which. Don Doc. Yeah. So I was thinking, maybe this isn't a good idea, <laughs> but it was interesting. They had, I can't remember the guy who managed them, but he, they came and saw me in Sarge at the Troubadour. And it was, it was a big manager. I can't remember who was it was. It Cliff, but... Was it Cliff Bernstein? Yes, yes. Yes. So they wanted me to come in and they asked, and now I had just started singing background vocals so i wasn't real solid at it yet but the band i was in sarge demanded a lot of it so they wanted to make sure i could sing but and jeff pilson supposedly sang like a bird so mm -hmm. that, that's how he ended up getting that gig did um sarge played with metallica were, you were there right yeah we played we we they opened for us which was odd so metallica metallica was having a hard time in the states and I remember, so, you know, they opened for us a Sarge. And once Sarge was over, because I think the singer joined a thing with Mark Tureen called Cagney and the Dirty Rats, which was signed to uh, Motown. Um, so I ended up joining Rough Cut 
because they had management and what have you. And I thought Paul was a good singer. We went over to Europe to play the marquee the club. And I ran into Lars and he said, you guys got to move here. This is where it's at because they, you, you can't get a record deal in the States. So that was, that was the story they had back in probably 19, I'm going to say 83 is when we did that. Tim yeah. Garcia was the original. Yes. Somebody said here, Tim Garcia was the original bass player, Mickey Rat. He was. Yeah. He I want to point out the, the reason where I, I sometimes say Matt is the original bass player is because Matt was the first to record uh, the first recording of Rat. Of Rat. Yeah. You know, what was the song? Is it Tell the World? Yes, and that was um, that was the first uh, song Warren recorded. So this is right about the time. So I was just leaving Rat, Rat and Warren came in. They didn't have a bass player. So I said, I'm going to do it, right? So that's how that happened. I just went over there. I didn't know the song. I don't think any of us knew the song, really. I think we just kind of, Stephen showed it to us. Stephen wrote that song. Yeah, and so we're, we're, we're talking about it now. And they, of course, people had have some interest but yes tim garcia i mean rat had a lot of lineups mark torian was in the band for two seconds there was oh uh you weren't in the band with him though right that was before. I almost i almost rejoined they they were having problems with juan because juan was flip-flopping between dawkin and and uh rat so they did robin wanted me in rat so and, and i was friends with warren so i, I was i did kind of join for a day and then I was a flake and flaked. And Robin gave me shit over for, about that at one point at the whiskey. He goes, you're, you're a flake. Because <laughs> I changed my mind. One of the things, Matt, that I love uh, talking to you is that you're, you know, you're very mild-mannered about your accomplishments. And, you know, it's not every day you sit and talk about things you've done. Uh, you're, you're, not, you're definitely not a bragging type of person mm -hmm. so i laugh when you tell stories yeah and then jake and warren and ronnie and these are people who are uh, to a lot of people are very legendary and i love to hear uh um these stories actually dr paul shortino kind of echoing what i said i enjoy matt telling stories they're honest and not all self-hype and and what a compliment uh matt, well, yeah. coming, from, coming from dr paul shortino yes for sure yeah and uh, the, some people think that there was a conflict that Juan was busy having taking dance um, lessons. He might have been. I, I was. I don't know, but he was definitely um, in Dawkin. And I'm going to tell you, I saw Juan play in Dawkin at the Roxy. This was before Rat, and Dawkin was kind of Don Dawkin was kind of a big deal in Hollywood. Nobody had really. At that point, there was Motley Crue, but they hadn't they hadn't even done their album yet. So Don Dawkin was kind of like the rock star of Hollywood at the time. And he was so, a little older too, right? Huh? He was a little older, right? He was a little older and he had that, everybody knew that song. Um, everybody had that album with, uh, uh, what's the song? Break, Chains. Breaking the Chains? Breaking the Chains, yeah. And, and I knew how to play it on guitar, so I had heard all this stuff, you know. And then I went and saw Don Dawkin and I dock in with Juan. And Juan did a bass solo, and I don't remember how it went, but it was it was really good. Like it, he was way better than me, and I was like, "Whoa, Juan's killer!" Right? And the funny thing was, is I re he used to borrow my amp, Juan, right? And he he I don't know why he didn't have an amp, but he'd come over to my house in Hollywood. I lived on Kingsley Street and Hollywood Boulevard, and he'd go, "Can I borrow your amp?" And he'd come over and borrow my SVT, and I used to ask him, I go. He, he goes, you play too hard. That's why. He goes, you're hitting the strings too. You got to lighten up your touch. Which is the, I was like 19. I had no idea. But that's, he gave me a little couple pointers. Isn't that funny? Did you lighten up how you hit the strings? I never, not when he, I could, you know, it, it didn't really come to me till way later. I don't know if it was his influence that changed it. But I do, I do, when I'm playing in here, I play with a really soft touch. When I play with Steven, I don't. I play, I, I dig in, but I, I think it's just <laughs> some of these comments. I think it's just because uh, I, I need to hear myself. So, and, and I like, I like a little bit of punch. Well, I think sometimes playing bass, it sometimes feels like you're doing something more 
if you're hitting a little harder. Otherwise, you could lull yourself to sleep pain base sometimes. I sometimes like to move around the neck more than you actually have to, because it at least looks visually like something is happening. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I'm kind that. of with you on that. I, I actually enjoy just trying new stuff all the time because it's you, you keep, especially with with rat songs in bass. There's not a lot going on, so I always riff. I always I'm pretty busy in those songs, but. I just kind of do my own part. I learned all of Juan's parts initially, but then I've, I've over the years I've just changed them to to entertain myself. Well, and I think in the case of something like bass, I think it's okay. I mean, you know, sometimes guitar solos and things should be played close to the way Warren played them, and, and certain things like that. But I think in bass, you know, uh, you can only improve upon some of those uh, lines. Uh, uh, Sean asks, hello, Jason and Matt. As a bass player, I'm curious on Matt's thoughts on finger per picking versus using a pick. I play with a pick, but some people have criticized me for cheating. Does the technique matter? Good question, Matt. Matt and I may have different opinions. I think certain songs require a pick. I mean, I typically am more comfortable with fingers, but I started on guitar, so pick wasn't too unusual for me. I think when I first started playing bass, I... I played with a pick. Then I took bass lessons and he started getting me to play with my fingers and I became more comfortable with it. And, but, or, you know, I think in the early eighties when we were doing rough cut, I would do some songs with pick and some songs with fingers, depending on the song. So it was really dependent on the song. L the more I played at home, I play with typically fingers way more than I play with a pick. And I think I was better had a, with a pick in the early 80s than I am now because I play so much with my fingers. So I you have play, you play one song with a pick, right? In the in the set now. I, I will change it up. Sometimes I will always play Sweet Cheater with a pick. And mm -hmm. sometimes I'll play Body Talk with a pick. And rarely I play if I can't hear myself, I'll play Lay It Down with a pick because I can't hear the articulation. Sometimes I wear earplugs, ear protection. And it's really hard sometimes with some of the sound that we get, some of the sound systems we get in a bigger places that I, it's just rumbling. And when I have the air protection, I can't hear what I'm doing. So when it requires something like lay it down, which is dun, da, da, dun, da, dun, da, da, dun, da, dun, da, da, dun. And I, and I don't hear that. I want to be really tight with the kick drum. So I stand next to the kick drum and I might use a pick. It just depends. It just depends on how I'm hearing things on that song. But for sure, Sweet Cheaters just doesn't sound good with your fingers. It sounds sloppy. So, well, and that's a very, you know, that Rat EP is almost like uh, punk rock songs in a sense. That's what Steven right. has even described them as. And so it is a little bit of a different style. I, I feel like what Matt said, it depends on the style of music you want to play. If that's you want right. to play a, a punk rock or that kind of music, you're going to have to use a pick because that's you're going right. to have to play down. And you're going to, you hear the notes different. Also, right. Duff McKagan say it, and it's what inspired me, is that the percussive sound of That's the right. pick hitting the strings is part of the some sound. of the music. Some bass players use really, really heavy picks. I switched to back to the normal, whatever these are, celluloid or whatever they're made out of. Yeah. It's just, it's just, I, think they're like, I do the same thing. They're like heavies, but they're not super heavies. They're just right. This is a heavy, but... It, it has some give, and so right. I like that. I res some of my favorite players, you know, guys like James Jamerson, play with their fingers. But if you want to talk about playing uh, right or wrong, James Jamerson only played with one finger, so yeah, right. he, he he could rake, rake up and down the strings with one finger. Most people, his own son, who was a great bass player, couldn't do it. So I think there's something for everybody, depending on the style you you want to play. When I played cover songs. And I would learn songs. There were certain songs that I said, I've got to play this with my fingers. And the pick doesn't oh, have right. It works. Sad. That's right. You know what's funny? I was, is I, I, was I always was a fan of like the early Aussie stuff when I was young. The, you know, um, some of those licks Bob Daisley was doing. Ding, ding, do, do. All those cool parts. And I always thought they were fingers because he had such a warm bass tone, right? So I didn't realize he didn't he didn't play with his fingers. He came in here and he recorded and he had a Fender bassman. 
he brought and he played the whole, everything with a pick. Mm. I was kind of shocked because I, I was so, I was so on that he played with his fingers. I was, wow, but he's a great, ba- I don't take, so I don't take that away from him. He's just a great bass player, whether he plays with a pick or fingers, but I always thought it was fingers because of the warmth of the sound. Yeah. I probably would have thought that too. Uh, uh, I saw a question I wanted to get to. Uh, would you say that Rough Cut is done for good? Hmm. Con- uh, confirmed. Yes. Did you? Would you say? Confirmed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, that question can get a different answer, but um, in my first interview with Matt, uh, when I first started the show, I interviewed. Uh, um, Paul Shortino, the Paul Shortino, Matt and Amir, and they had put out a record called Quiet Riot 3 that I thought was very in- enjoyable, something that Matt put together in his studio. Carlos Cavazzo played some guitar as well. I, I think it was re- very good. Uh, but there were some issues with the other two guys, and for a minute you almost had a, a fake rough cut. It, it seemed a little uh, uh, crazy. When I f- was working with Steven at one point, we brought in Chris Hager and uh, and and. He, that's not so and you get along with so great but uh, he didn't last very long and uh, then johnny monaco came in and then we were able uh, to get you back on board because you played with steven uh for so many uh, years uh, quite, somebody, uh, mentioned, somebody well, mentioned great. mars cowling who's pat travers bass player that guy is amazing now he gets a weird tone it's very it's very um pointy doesn't have a lot of bottom which if you notice a lot of bass players that are really good play with Less bottom, like even uh, why well, can't I think of his name right now? The guy, the most Jocko. All right. He played very tr- a lot of treble to his tone. Played really close to the bridge and very kind of. But so did Mars Cowell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun, you know. That, that like I was saying, Matt, talking to you, you there's you have so much knowledge on different topics and then people who've been in your life. So it's funny that we start the show talking about you know, pop culture knowledge, yeah. but that now it, bass players. people get it, but people really enjoy it. I, I love having bass players on the show because I'm always fascinated what draw, draws people to bass and also what they hear in the playing. Everyone does something different. Everyone uh, uh, it has a different style and is motivated. So I enjoy, and I've had some great bass players uh, on this show. Uh, uh, Colleen asks, what brand of strings do you prefer? I like the DR strings. I used to use Roto Sounds when I first started. I, I loved Roto Sounds because John Antwistle was on the cover, but mm-hmm. um, they would they would they wouldn't last very long. They would, you know it was like it was like a two gig string. The DRs seemed to last a little bit longer. I mean, I, I know a lot of people that use the 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 GHSs, the stainless steel ones. But my strings, I like. I I think I go for the aesthetic look of these strings more than anything because they're salt they're black yeah i like those and it's just on a black base so i have this black base with black strings now somebody said to me the other day we were out i think at this boat and they said you should get red ones so i thought that might be kind of cool to have red ones against black so i might experiment. Yeah, I, I think that goes good uh i saw a question i wanted and where the hell did it go um somebody asked why i gibson les paul bass instead of the jazz bass i mean i love the jazz bass but I, it's like everybody uses these fenders. I'm, it's all, I, I'm just all about aesthetics. And I like the way that j- the Les Paul bass feels, but I had to gut it. It was like it, the, w- how those things come, they come with Bartolini preamp inside. You got to take all that stuff out and make it a passive bass. You can't have all that wiring. Act- just like silly crap. I like, I played that bass uh, like a little bit uh, and it was, I liked that it. It's a light, it's light, you know, you don't yeah. want to carry a, a massive heavy no. bass. I was showing the back of your CD, which is called yeah. uh, "Back the Funk Up," and it, it on the back of it you show the bass that you played on each track, which I think yeah. is really, which is really cool. And yeah. uh, it, it it is a, it's a different concept. Obviously, Matt has a lot of basses there, but I mean, if you're really a fan, maybe you'll hear a difference in, in the songs and the bass. Well, they definitely all basses have a different sound. Yeah, I really so the jazz bass. It's very growly, which is kind of cool. So if you're playing something you want a little more of an aggressive tone, 
you I always pick that bass. It also it's very versatile. So if you take the tone knob down, you can get that kind of Jamerson sound. Um, and I have a P bass that'll do that too. But uh, you know the jazz bass for that kind of stuff, and and the and the Rickenbacker, you get that growl to it. I don't know if people know, but a Rickenbacker is a stereo bass. So each pickup on a Rickenbacker can go to a different amp. So the Rickenbacker on the bottom, the 1970 Rickenbacker has a stereo output, which splits the bridge pickup to, and the neck pickup to, it can go to different amps. And what's cool is you can send it maybe to a pedal, just the treble pickup and the, and the amp for the bottom end. And so you can get distortion on the treble pickup and then the neck pickup, you can get kind of a warmer sound. So I don't know if people know that about the uh, old Rickenbackers. Well, let me let me play the Rickenbach Rickenbacker yeah. uh, through guitar amps. Is how he right. that's how he played. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. He was an interesting uh, guy. Uh, I was fortunate to have got him to do some events, which is not easy. And then watching uh, how he set things up and how he got his sound, and he was definitely an original. Uh, yeah. uh, I saw a video the other day where somebody was, they were giving him a new amp and the guy was behind the amp doing this. The guy who gave him, he was testing the amp for him. I could have. I was probably only very loud. Imagine. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, we're going to be, uh, if you want to see Matt uh, on tour with Stephen Piercy, uh, there's a lot of shows being added every day. I sometimes forget what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not. Uh, I know that we're going to Texas as soon as this show is over. I'm booking plane tickets. Are you? And, yeah. And uh, we'll be in Texas. Uh, you know, I was talking to Michelle last night. So we're going to fly into Dallas the day before. And I am going to go and visit the John F. Kennedy uh, locations. And mm. we discussed, is that something Matt would go see? Because when we were in Baltimore, I said, Matt, would you like to go see Edgar Allan Poe, the things? And Matt said, no chance. No. But... Matt was up for the Aerosmith house. So yeah. would going to see where John F. Kennedy's brains hit the some cement, would that interest you? Yeah, I do think, I think that would interest me. How yeah. far is it? That's what's always the. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to book a hotel very close. Oh, because yeah, the, the, the deterrent is always, is how much of a pain in the ass is it? You're but if be it's right not a pain in the ass, I would probably, yeah. I, I think I'd like to see where this happened. And I'm wondering yeah. if I ever have. I don't think so. I was going to say you've probably passed the uh, you probably passed the grassy knoll at some point in your uh, in your travels. I was thinking maybe I can get us a room right next to the book depository where uh, the, the shots were allegedly fired. <laughs> then it's just a oh, short man. walk. Does that building still exist? It does, and you can go in the building. They'll take you to the window where the shots were allegedly fired, and it's glassed off now. So you, they, everything's exactly the way it was. I think they have the weapon, and right. there's some boxes there. And then there's other things. Um, I, 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 my Kennedy history is not great, but uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is, is, the, is known to be the shooter, uh, but Jack Ruby shot him. And I believe when they went to arrest Jack Ruby, he was in an old movie theater. Uh, uh, I think that's the story. One of them was in an old movie theater. So anyway, these are things that are all in walking distance of the grassy knoll uh, that yeah, I would that like. Was, that is interesting that all those things happened and, and we still don't really know why. That's amazing. And that's one thing we said last night. When you hear about unsolved mysteries, you would think someone who assassinated a president would be 100% solved. But uh, it doesn't no, seem it's that. not. We we don't. We still don't know how all those dots are connected. Um, did, did you watch this Vander Sloot uh, documentary that was on recently? I think it's on Peacock, where he confesses to the Holloway uh, murder. Did you have you seen this yet? No, no. I have to watch it. It's it's out, and it's. It, I gotta tell you, it's it's interesting. He's an interesting character. He's 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 kind of a um, what are they called sociopath where he doesn't really have any kind of guilt. There's it's just yeah, not no remorse. A, no remorse. Yeah. He doesn't have that thing that happens in your stomach when you did something bad. He doesn't have that. Yeah. He, he killed the second person. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it tells yeah. about that. Yeah. You would think this dummy got away with something, you know, uh, 
But yeah, no, there's something wrong with him. I felt sort of bad uh, when we got to Aruba. You can't help but think about this poor girl yeah. in that story. Um, the, her family and police and American authorities were very hard on their government yep. to, to, to solve the case. But unfortunately, she went to a secluded area of the beach and this maniac hit her with a cinder block and threw her in the water. It's not easy to solve a case like that where there's sharks and things and, no. and you're not going to find remains. And yeah, this kid had some money and some influence, but it, it was a very hard case for them to solve, even though people knew uh, or suspected that it was him. But he was dumb enough to kill someone else. But he also did crazy things like come up with other, he would tell the parent, her family, I'll tell you where the body is for money. He was trying yeah, to like $225,000 or something. I, I think mean, one of the, their attorneys suggested that, that the, the Holloway's mother give him $10,000. And he still feels guilty over that because he went, we he took that $10,000 to Peru and murdered the other girl. So they mm -hmm. kind of feel, you know, he has that on his conscience where he thinks that he kind of uh, spirited the financial way for him to murder this uh, other girl. What's interesting also is how many people he affected by this. He actually hurt the tourists uh, to, to the, to the tourism to Aruba. A hundred percent. Yeah. He, 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 he almost destroyed it himself. I mean, people were scared to go to Aruba or angry. They were really yeah. mad that Aruba didn't solve yeah. anything. I felt very safe when I was there. Uh, I wasn't going to go drinking with anybody I didn't know uh, or be alone, but uh, it seemed very safe. I had a, such a great time. The, the big iguanas were coming right up to us. Uh, uh, the food was incredibly fresh. I didn't have the iguana. But, uh, but so I had second thoughts and I know a lot of people are scared to get off these cruises. They think that, uh, you know, you hear about what's happening in Haiti and, uh, people are scared, but they don't realize that Labadee, Haiti, which is where we went, is really a, a private Island owned by Royal Caribbean. And they have an electric fence and they have very serious security and that this is not near what's happening. They do reroute as a precaution and also because I think people hear Haiti and they don't want to get off the boat. Now, I can't say that we're going to be on the Monsters of Rock cruise next year. Well, I, I will be, but I can't say who I'll be with or, or if you'll be there. But if you were going to be there, I looked at the lineup of where it's going to uh, go. And it's mostly places in the Bahamas that seem nice. Uh, it leaves from Miami this time. And one of the islands has some fancy, crazy name I never heard of. And as I researched it, uh, it's Norwegian Cruise Lines. They bought an island a bunch of years in the 80s. Not this one that starts with a C, is it? The, the it island. is something like that. I've been to that one. It's, it's three really words. Cool. It's the, the island's about the size of my, you know, it's it's very small. And um, I think you can walk around the island in 10 minutes. But it's really yeah. cool. And they have like, I, I think like they that. take one of the bands out in onto the island and they play. I think when I was there, they had George Lynch maybe playing on the island. I can't remember, but it, it was, it was really cool. And a small island. You, I mean, you, you just walk through this island. You're, the beaches are just right there and the water's really blue and aqua. So that's yeah, cool. You have to take a little boat from the that's cruise right. to the shore. Yeah, but it's worth it. So, and I want to point out that someone made the uh, point. It was Lee Harvey Oswald who was arrested in the movie theater, not Jack Ruby, which would make right. sense because when Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald in the handcuffs, famous photo, uh, he was obviously apprehended right there. So right. Lee Harvey Oswald was in the movie theater. But uh, if we get in early enough and we stay close enough in Dallas, uh, uh, we could have a field trip yep. to, see, uh, to see some history. If it's not too far, I'm, I'm game. And uh, yeah, Matt, you're usually, as people who watch the tour diaries, if things are in the area and we have time, you're usually game to see some history. It's strange because I've said this to you before. You probably didn't think at this point in your life you'd be back on tour. You have a successful no. uh -huh. business. Yeah. yeah. And to think I'm going to be back on the road. Now, there's a few things about what we do that make it easier. I think I, I, it's because it's, you're out on weekends, so you're able to do most of your work during the week. We fly 
okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? So I think uh, it, it's not like the old days where you're spending six weeks on a bus. But No. Um, okay, let's see uh, here. Uh, the sun uh, comes into my studio at this time right now. It's really I weird. notice. Yeah. It's just like blinding me. I got to get some uh, uh, window treatment. Yeah, I'm trying to go through and see if anyone has any other. I see. I saw something interesting. Oh, yeah. somebody yeah. wanted to know about Juan, which was interesting. Some some question about that was a while back, I think. I I, I might have missed it. Uh, I might have missed it. Uh, uh, McCartney used a pick. I guess that says a lot. Uh, but he didn't. Did he only use a pick? I don't think so. I think he. I think he went back and forth, and I yeah, think maybe as he's older, he uses a pick. But I don't think. Yeah, I don't think he is a, a pick guy uh, per se. Uh, I'm skimming through here. You know what I've noticed? No super chats today. So because no one's spending any money, make sure you're ordering uh, uh, Matt's CD because he's waiting by the phone. Uh, oh, operators are standing by right now to take your order. It's called uh, Back to Funk Up. And this is a collection of instrumental music. Uh, Matt will sign this for you. Uh, Matt looks like he's in the witness protection program right now or, yeah. or a lineup. Uh, <laughs> Now, somebody asked if I ever play fretless bass. It's, it's actually some of my favorite bass to play. I love fretless. Um, what was that song? Uh, if I, what was that song? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, it was a song in the 80s. Paul somebody. Great bass player played on this song. Famous bass player, I think. Um, yeah, and you know him. You mentioned his name I'll, before. I'll, I'll a few bars. I remember the bass line. Uh, oh, God, I can't remember the, the song. You think the singer is named Paul? Paul something. It was one hit wonder. He played like Paul, a, Young, he played Paul, Paul Young. It was Paul Young. Okay. That's right. And the bass player that played on the famous song. What was that famous song? He only oh, had one, so I'm sure. It I one song. Okay. Uh, if, every issue. time I go away, every, every time, time I go you away. go away, correct. Who is the bass player played on that? All right, let's. But that influenced me to play fretless bass. It's not Tony Franklin, is it? Ah, uh, no, no, no. I think it's okay. somebody that you know that you always mention. He was like a. Right, I'm, I'm looking away. every time I go away. Every time you go away, which uh, there was a Hole and Oats version as well. I, I've learned. And uh, uh, Pino Palladino. Oh, that, that is a name I say. Yeah. yeah, you do say that name. So that that oh, he played oh, bass, he played bass on that song. It's amazing. Yeah, Pino Palladino. Uh, uh, we we I see him at Nam every year, and I always point him out. Yeah, another definitely legendary guy. And thank you to Colleen, super chat uh, for a super chat and a correct uh, 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 answer. So. Uh, Thank you. I much appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, now the chat the, the, the chat is lighting up with Pino Palladino. I mean, this is an education. Uh, this crowd knows a lot. They do. They know more than I do. Mm -hmm. well, Mike Crawford is here. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it. I will tell you that doing this damn thing every day, it, it, it is time consuming and mind consuming and then bothering my friends to come on, especially when it's sundown in their Burbank mansion and you can barely see them. Uh, uh, so I thank you, everyone, for the super chats. Mike Crawford asked, uh, I asked if Matt played on the tracks he was involved with on Out of the Cellar, or was it Juan? I know I didn't, but I, I can't really hear bass on that record, to, to, to be completely honest with you. Bo doesn't seem to like to mix bass very loud. He takes all the tone off, so it's just kind of bottom end. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I know that I ha I did a song with Steven, probably, I can't remember the name of the song, but it was probably two records ago. I don't remember, but Bo mixed one of the, the song. And I, and I, the mix I had, the bass was just like loud and growly. I got it back and it was just like, so he's not a real big fan of bass. So I don't, I can't really hear bass on that first uh, out of the cellar record. It's kind of mixed low. Did yeah, you ever know 
the thing. And it's been re-released so many times, you think maybe it would have been remastered, but uh, mm. Crypto asked, what are my thoughts on Rod Stewart? I don't really have many. I mean, Rod Stewart's a legend. I want He's in Vegas every day. I'd like to go over and see him before uh, he's done, but it's he's not one of my favorites. Matt probably likes Rod Stewart more than I do. I do. My, my mom liked Rod Stewart. She was a huge Rod Stewart fan. She liked uh, Tonight's the Night and all these songs. I, 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 I mean, I respect Rod Stewart because he's got such a cool voice and it's different. But I don't think I was really a huge Rod Stewart. I think I liked Faces better than Rod Stewart. Yeah, Faces, Small Faces. There's mm -hmm. different eras of Rod Stewart and then the more the crooner uh, that people know and pop star as well. But uh, I respect him. It's just not something that I listen to that much. Uh, 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 Traveler of Thailand says Juan's bass lines are great, but he seems like he would be exhausting to tour with. Well, I toured with him, and I can confirm he was exhausting. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think uh, you know if they, they they should get the Rat back together, and uh, you know you should play bass, and uh, yeah, and then uh, Warren D. Martini, he's back out on the market. I saw uh, him at the fantasy camp. Did you watch that? Yes, I did, and you know Warren. I was telling somebody, Warren is one of these guys that's just born with the guitar. Like, I don't even think he needs to practice. There's always these guys that come come around every once in a while that don't need to practice at all. They're just good, period. I think he came – I saw him play in a band called Enforcer in San Diego back when he was probably 17 years old. And he'd only been playing for a little over – almost two years. But he smoked – I mean, like, it was just unbelievable how good he was. So I don't think – anytime I see him play, it's just always good. Yeah, uh, and you've told, you've said it before on the show that he – it was amazing that all these guitar players were coming out of San Diego who were great players, Jake E. Lee, Amir Darrock, uh, and, and yeah. Warren, and, and it just seemed like it was just a line. Who's going to be next? Who's the next great guitar player to get uh, a break? Yeah, now, I, when we did that Metal Massacre thing, Tell the World – the engineer, I'm trying to remember his name, but he immediately yeah. took a liking to Warren and had him do other sessions after that studio visit. Mm -hmm. Like he he said, well, I want that guy's number. And he had Warren come in and play on other people's stuff. I don't know if Warren ever did, but he did ask for it and want him to do it. And yes, the song was I Can't Take It. That was the song. On I can't the, take it. Bo, the Bow Hill mixed. That's right. Yeah. Uh all right uh, a lot of people enjoying uh, rat again you can catch you go to official stephenpiercy.com and that's where you can see the tour dates of where we're going to be it a lot of places and then we're doing some shows with uh, a skid row here on the west coast i like to see that uh mm -hmm. i don't know if you can say both of them yet but uh you I know think one of them was announced I was, you know, uh, Phil Susan, who I hung out with a little bit on this cruise, I was talking to him and he took, he played with Sebastian on this cruise. Yeah. And um, I was asking him, oh, that must not be too hard to pick up those songs, right? And he goes, actually, some of them are really hard. So I had no idea. Are they? I mean, I've never, I haven't heard a lot of Skid Row. I go, it's like, uh, what's the... Uh, What's the monkey song? I go, monkey that, goes the that, was, that, was, that was easy. Well, so I, I think that, talking about? I think that Rachel Baldwin had a good bass sound. He had a kind of a punk sound. Actually, when I made my record, I copied some stuff he did. But that song called Piece of Me has a bass intro. I wouldn't think of the bass playing as being that hard, but maybe there's a lot of different parts. I do think it's very different than Phil's style. Um, when I saw them playing it, I thought that this was not really... Uh, uh, the style of Phil, you know, Phil plays with uh, Last in Line right now, playing the Dio music. Um, Skid Row is, is would be a pick playing band for sure, and uh, okay. uh, there's distortion on his bass usually. I just think it was something different, and I think maybe for Phil, there's a lot of parts to remember because yeah. about, and then Sebastian also played some deeper solo cuts, and I think they expected him. He was a, it was a brand new band. The other two guys had never played with them, and so. To know these songs, you know, maybe Phil wasn't listening to Skid Row, you know. So if you, I think to learn a song 
that you don't know that well uh, could be a little harder. I That's watched uh, I watched some songs on YouTube, and I thought Phil did a great job. His bass sounded good. He, I mean, it was very prominent, and he, you know, he's solid. So I thought it was good. Second show was better than the first as they got a little bit more comfortable knowing what to uh, what to do. Did you see this whole uh, charade going on with the with uh, the wig? on um, the uh did you see this on the internet this the ace freely uh darkness dilemma a little bit uh that's pretty i have to be careful i have to be yeah. careful about what i say because people we know may may or may not be involved and be threatening to beat people up well it was it, it's it's the the darkness guys is very a good comedian i don't know if you knew this but he's very funny and the, the crowd seemed to like his jokes. They were egging him on. Which Most was, people say that the darkness stole that cruise. I know people who are on it and said the darkness was the most entertaining band on there. They're a good I band. Thought, I thought they were a bit of a parody to me, but no, people love it. I liked them when they came out. I thought it was it was kind of refreshing, and it was they, they kind of put a spin on it. I don't know if you remember the video where he had, they had all those Marshall stacks, and the guy yeah, was about the this big. Yeah, love. Great. They were kind of, they were fun. I can see, I can see the sense of humor now. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I kind of wish I would have seen them. They, uh, Ace reports of Ace on that cruise weren't good. Uh, most people said that he was very bad and he went on late. Uh, you know, they have excuses for everything. He looked like he had a team of bodyguards and things. I think a lot of that gets silly, uh, at some point, but. I mean, Gene Simmons flies Southwest and doesn't have a bodyguard, if that means anything. I will say, Gene Simmons is another bass player I like. Gene Simmons is very underrated. What I, I, had to learn, I had to learn a few of his early songs. And in the early days, he wanted to be like Paul McCartney, and he wanted to move all over the bass. Right. And there was a lot of walking bass lines in those Kiss songs. They sound easy, but then when you sit down, there's a lot to them. Later, when 80s Kiss came, he dumbed it down a lot, I, I found. He, those, those songs became easier and he was trying to fit in with some of the metal bands. But Gene is definitely underrated and he can play. I I saw him at one of these rock and roll fantasy camp things where he was talking about writing a song and I, he was fascinating. He kept saying, any idiot can play an instrument or do this, that, but can you actually write a song? And he was teaching these people how to take an idea, turn it into your own. And he was counting measures while biting an apple. And every time it was a different measure, he'd bite into his apple. <laughs> But no. he would pick up the guitar, he'd pick up the bass, and he was really, it wasn't just like this cash thing. He was concerned that these people learn how to contribute musically. Now, he, he I went to his house once, mm -hmm. and with with this band I was in called Jailhouse, and um, our singer had ran into him at the newsstand on the corner of Laurel Canyon and Ventura Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And they were there was a magazine stand, and they were both there. And he looked over at our singer because he had just went to the Roxy the night before and saw us play. And he goes, he looks over at him, come to my car. So Danny was a huge, his name's Simon now, but at the time his name was Danny to me. They went to his Rolls Royce and they talked. The next day, he set up a meeting for us to go to his house. We went up to his house and we went up to this little kind of cottage where I guess his son lived at the time on beverly Glen, they lived and we went there and the four of was there four of us five of us i think it was five of us and we all sat in his son's room waiting for gene to appear gene came in and he had his george washington kind of ponytail thing and he and he said and he put out his hand and he introduced himself as gene simmons so I, it, 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 i'm surprised he didn't say this is gene simmons yes he said, I, I'm Gene Simmons. And he goes, and his, we went on to say, the only reason we were in the music business is to get things um, to have oral sex. That was the only, to, 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 to get oral sex. That's what he said. And I thought that was a little interesting to start off with. You know what I mean? Maybe you can say that later in the, in the, in the meeting, but right off the bat, it was, I got his name and I figured out why I'm in the music business. So then we sat down and he he went on to say that our songs didn't have enough I in them. Like, I want to rock and roll all night party every day. So we had songs with the word we in it. I didn't realize this was like not good. 
So he said the reason for this was because people want to get to know you. At the time, I thought he was being ridiculous. Looking back, I kind of think he had a point. So they want to get to know you, and they want to, and they don't want to, they don't care about we. They can, although there's been a lot of songs with the word we in it. He said, "I like I want you," and th this was his whole rhetoric. He, and, he loves um, it loud. Yeah, I love it loud. Not we love it loud. No. And then he went on to play us uh, Van Halen demos and uh, Liza Minnelli demos. I know that's kind of uh, far off, but. The Liza Minnelli, he had signed Liza Minnelli to his label that was our, was up from RCA. Anyway, our guitar player and him didn't get along too well. Uh, the guitar player called him out on his tongue and his uh, boots and asked him to break them out. And uh, we got a letter from Gene saying uh, we, he hopes the best for us, but it doesn't seem like things are going to work. So that, that's what happened. Yeah, the good old days of letters, huh? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh... Uh, Jay Lee Smith, thank you for being a channel member. He says he loves Matt's new CD. It's awesome. So that's great. A lot of positive reviews. The Yelp reviews are massive for this. Uh, it, They're all, obviously, I wrote them all, by the way. I don't know if you know that. but also, You know who's got a good Yelp? I haven't mentioned him. Uh, Johnny Monaco has the best Yelp. Um, he Yelps a lot. Though. He Yelps that? a lot. He Yelps, he Yelps a lot. We went, so when we were going to Orlando... Uh, me and, and my significant other, Johnny, were on one flight, and uh, Matt, his, his lovely wife, Mel and Michelle all flew out of California, yes, right. and we met in Orlando. So me and Johnny, they had a direct flight. Me and Johnny had a connecting flight. We went to this sandwich place, a burger place. I think it was called Pops or something. I Johnny would remember. It was the worst ever. It was a cafeteria food, but they had pictures that made it sound good. And Johnny, he got that phone out. And he really works. He he's a composer. He yeah. and music and Yelp. He was thinking, and then he likes to save the document and then play it back with a voice reading it. He likes to hear it read and make sure. And he worked a long time. And boy, did he write an amazing Yelp review. And I go, do you have more of these? And then he showed me some of his Yelping. Oh my God, he's good. Now, he he's a good video editor too. I've been getting video. I think you've been participating in some of these. But I had a artist here who had a song called holy moly that you witnessed me saying i did not want to be a part of this holy moly song and um uh eventually it six months ago i think that was when i was saying that i event i finally finished holy moly and yeah and, 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 and now his name isn't even his real name anymore we just called the artist holy moly because because mm -hmm. you guys have realized how much but johnny I sent Holy Moly to you guys because I thought you'd be entertained on what Holy Moly was. So I sent Holy Moly to you. And Johnny did a, a really interesting video with some seashells and things like this. Yeah, he made a music video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was good. I wonder how much Johnny's going to be like uh, uh, J.D. Salinger. When J.D. Salinger passed away, he was a recluse. He has a million books in an archive that I, that I think they're supposed to release one every few months. I think some other artists, Prince might have had that too. They prepare for the future. Everyone thinks J.D. Sounder just wrote Catcher in the Rye. Well, Johnny has an archive of videos. He also has a file on everyone. I don't know if you knew that, Matt. But oh, Johnny, I don't. Is there, do I have one? I bet he has a file on you. And he definitely has one on me. He's waiting for us not to speak so that he can release his file. Are, are these are these documented files, like in case HR comes? I, I'm not sure, but he... Let me just tell you, his Chips Enough file is, oh. it, 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 yeah, it's insane. But he, he he's very so good. File, he, he, he puts the files in that Chips Enough suitcase? Possibly. <laughs> I mean, he only took that out once, but I think it's for sale. Um, but uh, Johnny is talented in, in uh, many, yeah. many he's ways. He's great video see, editor. I mean, it's very you, entertaining. Did you see Johnny on the can Candy episode as Paul Lynn? I didn't know. I saw him on the last episode uh, with you, which was well, what he was did. Going? Maybe I didn't the see day that. after that. He did the candy mystery boxes, and he decided oh. to dress in an ascot, <clears> and <throat> he looked like Paul Lynn. But he was very good, and people enjoyed it. And he had a lot of insight on uh, on the candy. We have a question from Southern Drummer, and I'm thankful that he has a uh, 
he has a super chat. I appreciate that. And Matt, while you answer this question, I'm going to turn that insulin alarm off. So uh, you're going to be on your own for just a minute. Don't panic. Uh, Question is, has Matt ever played, and if you have a, uh, make the answer long, has Matt ever played a Sheldon Dingwall custom shop Z-Base? Okay, Matt, over to you. Oh, no, that's me. Hold on, Matt. Don't go anywhere. Well, don't die. All right. Oh, that's, <laughs> hold on, Matt. You're, by the time, okay. Um, right. No. But how much do these things go for? I I, I don't know. I'm have you ever heard of it? I've never heard of a Sheldon Dingwall custom shop Z-Base. No. When I was a kid, there was a TV show, Yogi's First Christmas, Yogi Yogi Bear, huh. and he, uh, Mr. Dingwell, owned the uh, the lodge. This is what I, this is what I have. Uh, for people who are wondering, I have. I, everyone knows I have diabetes, but I have to turn the alerts off. There's a thing in my arm that goes off. Uh, if my blood is high, it's a little high. It's not a big deal. I can survive. I don't need an alert. Uh, but do you ever have false alarms? <laughs> uh, sometimes the alarm, uh, sometimes the alarm loses signal and then it goes off, which is really annoying. Southern drummer, thank you for the question. So this Dr. Paul Shortino guy, uh-huh. the, he says the knee guy ruined it with Gene. How does I mean he he he's basically no. named the guy, so Hold he on. knows he knows some inside stuff. Is that name that Dr. Paul said the name of the guitar player? No. So Neve was a band that got signed to Columbia by John. Cl- I think Randy Jackson signed them to Columbia in uh, I would say mid nineties and the guy in that band was the one that was in jailhouse. <clears throat> he he knows uh Dr. He knows. Paul knows his stuff. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh Jeremy would like to know if you would show us your pride and joy bass. What is it? What's the story? Where did you get it? Do you have a bass handy you could show us? You know, I think my actually my one of my favorite bass is this bass. Um it's a I'm gonna go get it. It's a Fender P bass, but it's a 90s, I think it's a 97. And if you notice here, it's a Fender P Deluxe. And this pickup is two gas bass pickups stacked. And then you got your P bass pickups. And it plays extremely well. Um, it's a maple neck. Um, it's a little smaller than your typical bit, uh, P bass, but it gets tons of different tones. And it plays really nice. So I think this would be, and you know who recommended me to get this bass? Was Greg DiAngelo. Oh, said, my line. Yeah, he said, in my studio once, I had this guy bring a Fender P bass deluxe from the 90s. Now, they have these Fender P bass deluxes now, but they don't have the stacked jazz basses. So they just have the one jazz bass pickup. But in the 90s, they put out that bass, and it's it's it, they they were really good bases and they're not that much money if you buy them on reverb they're like you know, i think at least i think i paid 900 for that and the most i've ever seen them are like 15 so they don't really in, increase too much in price they pretty much stay uh i think they just sell them for that amount so they really haven't um escalated that much but yeah I, that's probably my favorite and the second is my jazz bass which is just a basic it's like a reissue of a it's i think it's japanese i don't even think it's an american made but it's got a really slender neck um i like my i like my thunderbird but i like the les paul better um but you yeah can i mean, hear all these bases i have a music you can, band. you can hear all these bases right here matt has anyone purchased one yet oh yeah today? yeah 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 let's see oh, okay thank god i was worried i was losing my touch order here yep I got three new orders. Okay, great. Well, Matt is going to sign that for you if you like, and he'll send it to you, and you can order picks and things. And here is the link once again. It's very easy. It rolls off the tongue just like the name of the record. Uh, Back the Funk Up, which is right there. And uh, there it is. So you go to mattthorne.myshopify.com and uh, pick pick one up. Uh, 
you know, I got to say, I recommend Shopify to anybody who's selling anything. I'm and thinking about trying one. I think you talked me into it. Yeah. I mean, for the first three months, it's a dollar a month. So it's three bucks. After that, it kind of goes up to 35 bucks a month. But if you want to, it's really makes it really easy for people to buy things on. So I would recommend it. Now, uh, we had a question. Now, this is a question that he's answered a lot, but we'll try to see if we can get some in. Mitch Wooten asks, any cool stories on work working with Dio and Rough Cut? So before you answer, Matt, I'll say that he's talked in length in our interviews about both of those situations. But is there anything you could think of off the top of your head? I will say that Ronnie watched a lot of sports. Probably people know this. And he would he would his lyrics were based in on a lot of sports which is kind of weird right but yeah. i do remember him i do remember him we we did taker uh, rough cut had the song taker on the first record and i remember paul he couldn't get a hold of paul for some reason to come in and sing and he went in to sing paul's part some background vocals and he also had to do some parts on taker that Paul wasn't there for, lead vocals. And he made himself sound exactly like Paul. You can't tell. You can't tell it's not Paul. So is know. Dio in the mix on that? Huh? Is Dio on the album? Like mixed it's in? It's not there? on the album. It's on the demo, which is way better. The one yeah. that Ronnie, Ronnie and Angelo Curry uh, did for us. It's the, the, the tech taker on the demo was much better. And I have it. Um, and he, on that demo, Ronnie did some vocals filled in where Paul, he wanted to change Paul's parts and Paul, we couldn't find him. So he just went and did it, but it sounded exactly, I can't even tell you, I can't even tell the difference. And a lot of those lyrics too on Taker are Ronnie's. Interesting. Did, Ronnie's did, Angelo, really good lyrics. did Angelo engineer the rough cut album? No. Um, so we should have, in my opinion, I thought we should have went with looking back in retrospect, I think Ronnie would have been the better producer. Um, we ended up using a guy named Tom Allen who did Judas Priest. And I think I'm trying to remember the, it was his engineer, really cool guy. Ah, Dodson. Um, Mark Dodson was the engineer. So Mark Dodson and Tom Allen did the record, but it, you know, that record was very polished in comparison to what Ronnie was doing with this on the demos they were very edgy and kind of more of a less of a slick sound which which we would have used done that it would have been fit in better with what was going on because the whole slick sound was mtv at the time and mtv dropped all new debut bands done so if you were a debut band coming on mtv when we came out you weren't getting on mtv so it would have been better to fit in with more of the accepts of the world and the kind of edgier bands. Yeah, I can see so that. I, I kind of wish jo uh, Ronnie would have done it. But Ronnie was, you know, Ronnie, Ronnie seems like he could just sing anything. And it's funny because my neighbor down here, he's two doors down from me, went to high school with Ronnie James Dio. And he said that Ronnie James was a star at the school as far as singing goes. Like – Everybody followed him around and he used to drive the, he used to be, he was a rock star in high school, which I never knew. Yeah. Interesting. It's a lot, it's a lot of stuff. So anyway, that's just a little bit of a history. Uh, trying to scam, skim through some of these uh, questions. I find this one funny. It doesn't need an answer. Could Matt teach Nikki six how to play bass? I'm sure Matt could teach uh, anyone. But, you know, I, I, I'm kind of, I remember Nikki being okay in the, I mean, I don't know this, this whole story of, you know, people playing. I've heard terrible stories about even John Taylor not playing on Rio, and it wasn't true. So, you know, you, you, these stories can kind of be started by anybody who's got, who's disgruntled against Well, somebody. you used to know. play, you used to play Rat and Motley Crue played yeah. the same venues. I thought he was good. Yeah, I you, he was you, did, good. you did two shows, right? Didn't you do sometimes like a, an evening and a late night show with them? Yeah, we did the country club and I oh, own the Troubadour. I think one you're talking about where we played two shows back to back, rat, motley, rat, motley. 
And I always thought, I mean, look, I went and saw Motley Crue at the Whisk at the Troubadour for the first time, and they were the only band that I thought had anything going on. They were so good. So I mean, to pick on to pick on Nikki like that, I'm not so sure. And and also the drummer Tommy Lee was amazing. I, I'm I'm not going to be on that whole that that sinking ship of him sucking. I I don't think that's true. Now Let's maybe see. maybe over the years he doesn't practice as much. I don't know. But at the time in the in the 80s, he wasn't a bad bass player by any means. He was his tone was big. He played a Thunderbird. It's, I mean, it was cool. Let's say that maybe he wasn't the greatest bass player in the world. And let's say that maybe they went in the studio and maybe he felt more comfortable letting someone who can work faster. Be, uh, being in a studio is a, can be a scary thing, especially with a budget. And some bass players, back then we're talking about tape, but now even punching in, some people don't know when to do it. I had a play on my own album, and I'll be honest, there was one or two times where I took the bass and I said, you play that part. It might have been a short part, but maybe it was something that someone would have played better than me or faster. That, that, happens. that happens all the time on my studio. Like, I, I'll go, give me that, and I'll just play it because it can happen faster. And people don't really have a problem with it, especially if you develop a relationship with them. So, yeah, I, I get it. And some of the bass stuff that was on maybe Smoking in the Boys' Room, I thought the bass stuff on that was kind of cool, right? Um, There's Motley. And, you know, I, and, and the 80s was a big thing to get these players that don't, that are the band members not to play on their records. I mean, I think, I think Bo Hill did this with He's bands. Yeah. You know, he would go, well, let's get this guy in here who can smoke it, right? So that was a big thing. I didn't realize this that Jack Douglas told me that Joe Perry didn't play on train kept a rolling and a lot of those songs on the second on um on what's that record called yeah uh i can't think of the name of the record but he he uh the, the guitar player was on my show his name is steve hunter and uh there was dick wagner and steve hunter they were a duo of guitar players mainly known for playing with alice cooper they played this all, all the billion dollar baby solos uh, 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 really good stuff. A lot of other things too, but they were in the studio when Aerosmith was recording. I, I know it's a source subject for Joe Perry. He felt he could have done it, but Jack at the time, those guys were around and he thought they could come in and do a kind of cool thing. And so that tr uh, train kept the rolling recording is uh, Wagner and uh, Hunter. Steve Hunter was such a great interview on my show. Uh, for those who are new here, if you dig deep, he's, he's blind. He has... Um, I believe it's cataracts, but his wife told me I'm going to sit him down and he's going to face the camera and it's going to look like he can see you, but he can't. Um, but he told great stories, but he did not want to talk like any trash or anything controversial. He didn't want to take away from what anyone else is playing. Um, he had worked with David Lee Roth and he had not one crazy thing to say about David Lee Roth. And you know, he saw some stuff, oh, yeah. um, but he was great. And there was somebody else. Oh, Carmine Rojas, a great bass player, has a definitely a guy with his own style. There's a rumor that he played a lot of the bass on Theater of Pain. Um, who knows? He's going to come on the show, and I'm going to ask, and we'll see. A lot of people are scared to say anything. Bob Rock kind of implied that he played a lot of bass, probably on Dr. Feelgood, and then Nikki was very upset with him for, for saying that. Uh, look, Nikki Six wrote a lot of legendary songs. And is the look, he's one of the few guys where he's more famous than the lead singer. That's the That's only right. band where the bass player and the drummer are more famous than the guitar That's player right. or the singer. You know, um, the Jack Douglas, I, I, we did our second Rough Cut record with him. So he, I, I knew him pretty well. So he was probably being very honest with us. But I played on the second Rough Cut record. He did not have some session player come in. But he did... I remember there's a song called Double Trouble that I had. It was very bass oriented. The whole, the whole song is bass. And um, he did have me come in and punch in one note every bar. He, I hit a B, an E, and he wanted me to hit the B. So, and I didn't understand why I was doing this because I thought what I was doing was cool. And he was like, it was like, anyway, he had me hit the beat on the doll. 
he hit me at that beat and he was just punched and it was like this the jay messina jay messina who did aerosmith uh all those aerosmith records toys in the attic rocks he was punching on the analog machine every time i'd hit that beat but it was trippy that he heard me he heard that he also had this weird idea one day that we sat around in the studio i don't know if you know but studios were like twenty five hundred dollars a day and he had to sit around we were going to do one song that day and he had to sit there all day and wait for traffic and he put a mic out of the those little vents in the side of things into the street to wait for traffic and the you know all that happened was a bus went by and that's on the record amazing a bus so we wasted pretty much twenty five hundred dollars to get a bus on the record yeah, it's that seemed like a lot of those kind of producing um, uh, things were happening. Uh, YT says, have you ever heard of Iron Maiden? The bassist runs the show. Yes and no. Yes, Steve Harris is the original member. Yes, he writes. Yes, he uh, runs the band. But I still think that Bruce Dickinson is more famous and more recognizable. I think you, Iron Maiden, you still uh, want to scream for me Long Beach uh, with the singer. Although Steve Harris is a great uh i like the mentioned. singer i like the singer before what was the guy's name uh, i love that album paul, Killer. Paul, the, the, the cool yeah. answer is paul deano people from your generation really like the first uh, i did uh, they like the killers album and they like yeah. paul deano yeah. murders in the room org yeah i like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. it's good stuff on there uh it's one of those bands that survived a, a singer change blackie yep. lewis wasn't a bad bass player well he said, I can't think of the term he used. I'm sure someone in the comments knows, but he said it's like the tool of idiots or something. He, no. is, he's, he's he was stopped. in here too. He came to my studio once too. Blackie Lawless? Yeah. So check this out. So the the some his representative called me on the phone. He goes, hey, listen, Blackie's coming in. Is there? Uh, is it a safe neighborhood? I go, it's Burbank. It's like leave it to Bur Beaver, right? And he goes, is there places to park? I go, yes. He goes, now, he's going to come in, and we can't have you looking at him. And I said, what's going on here, right? So he comes in. He's got sunglasses on, and I'm afraid to look at him. Like, okay, I've been told, do not look at him. Right. I made sure there was a parking place. And he comes in here, and um, he starts talking about gear, and I accidentally look at him, and nothing happened. We looked at each other the rest of the session. <laughs> So I don't think he cared. I don't think he cared if people looked at him. I think this is just a big wind up. Yes, I think these people get involved and they prepare people for something. I'm going to start doing that with Steven, I think, to tell him <laughs> nobody speak to him or look at him. And then he'll go, hey, this place is great. Nobody even spoke to me. You know? Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I, uh, he called it the tool of ignorance, I think. And that's when he said, I'm going to stop playing bass. Um, oh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, so a lot of people are talking about Nikki Six, and some people say he improved. I don't want to jump on the bashing of those guys either. I will say it's fact, uh, not fiction, that for a lot of years, Nikki Six's bass was pre-recorded during their live shows. Maybe he felt he could give a better show without playing. Maybe he thought it would sound better. Who, who knows what he was thinking? But there was a laptop or two um, that... And Mick Mars has alluded to this as well, that he didn't play. You can watch the Us Festival. I didn't think Motley Crue were very good uh, in the Us Festival, but he played. You know, So I think as years go on, you figure, you know what, I'm going to put more of my energy into the show, and no one really cares how my bass playing is. That's my guess. I would think that's correct. I think that you know, I was watching a Taylor Swift video, and she can sing, and – some fan had a phone up close and she was moving around a lot and you could hear her singing. She was basically just kind of singing a lower part, whispering almost because she was doing other things. So I think, and it's not because she can't sing. Yep. It's just because, you know, she, that that's the way things are these days. I saw Motley Crue here in Vegas at the Hard Rock and uh, Nikki Six will apologize to the crowd many times because he had laryngitis. Yet when a big chorus would come, <laughs> uh, like the Saints of Los Angeles, boy, could he suddenly sing. Well, because uh, it was no excuse that they used backing vocals. I mean, I think sometimes you want to see a big show. You, I don't think you go to see Motley Crue for the musicianship. You go for the big show That's and right. 
and the and the folklore that they've created, these stories that they did this and that, and, um, I think is I don't kind think of most people care. I think it's just musicians, you know, you know. Eddie Trunk, so, he's very upset. Uh, Steve, Stephen has said to me, Rat did just as many fucked up things as Motley Crue, if not worse. They just didn't uh, a videotape it, you know, or, 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 or at the time make books about it. But yeah, he says that it was pretty, uh, pretty bad. And anyway, you know, Matt, I could talk to you all day. And normally I was just going to do an hour and then start the other video. But Air Supply hit me with 50 copyright infringements. Uh, no not, way. Yeah. I, I mean, it was actually hit you. Yeah, they they, did. They, yeah, the two old fucks are at my door. You know, they got nothing else to do. Listen, you got to take that. I went to see Air Supply on the cruise because I was there. And Michelle, through her, her family, kind of grew up with some of those songs. I expected it to be uh, old and boring. And and it delivered. It, it was old and boring. Really? Oh. But the, <laughs> the band was now, good. I saw Sebastian try to sing a uh, Air Supply song. Well, if when this tour diary comes out, you will see that. Um but he, they had a good band, a kind of heavy band. The guitar player shredded. I mean, they had, and they do sound good, but those songs are snoozers. And right. when, and I like all kinds of music. I mean, I listen to, you know, Frankie Valley. I mean, I like different things. I don't only like metal, but uh, Air Supply, oh my God. But I was listening to the songs and I said to Michelle, this sounds like a bunch of uh, meatloaf ripoffs. Some of these songs. And then I go, I keep listening, and I go. Now it sounds like uh, uh, Bonnie Tyler, and I'm, I, I'm starting to figure it out. And then I realized Jim Steinman wrote those songs, oh. and a lot of those songs were written for Meatloaf, but the label didn't want to pay Jim Steinman to use the songs, so he gave them to uh, Air Supply. So, uh. um, anyway, they every little second I used of their video. Um, it was copyright. I went to Debbie Gibson's dance class. Uh, she dances in her bare feet, by the way. Uh, um, I saw that. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, still- well, it did good for my video. 28,000 people tuned in. And one of the most searched things, Matt, to find that video is foot fetish. I, I'm not joking. No. You can people see. Like- I don't know how they figured it out, though. How do they know? How does the algorithm know that foot fetish should take you to that video? They, can they see that her bare feet? Anyway. Maybe there's a lot of comments about the bare feet. Maybe. I'm going to start hashtagging it. But anyway, this next episode, you'll see her dancing and you'll see her feet. But they, they, a lot of the music was controversial. They did allow Sebastian Bach singing with the key. is If it doesn't sound the same, you can get away with it. So Sebastian didn't really sound like Air Supply. No, he didn't. So no, he did not. You could sneak it. There's another trick that you could set things off. You could turn it. You could make it a half pitch off and things like that. You can. There are tricks to get around, but I don't yeah, have that really. kind of time. Um, so I just want people to see the uh, to see it. But I think I'll put it out uh, Monday morning. Uh, some people are just so stupid. I have a few uh, dummies every now and then. Uh, I think uh, somebody was telling me once, this comedian, <clears throat> that he lived in Hollywood, and um, Debbie Gibson lived next to him, and she was annoying him for some reason, <clears throat> and um, so he blasted her music out of his window at her in retaliation. I uh, I did a video. You know, this show started during the lockdown, and I was doing it on Facebook. And I had some neighbors playing really loud music, and so I took my uh, bass amp, it was a big one at the time, and I wheeled it out into the backyard, faced their window, and I just turned on the feedback and, and gave them a bass solo. And then I played um, Slayer South of Heaven next through the speakers. And it, it, it did effectively it did, work. It really annoy people. I had a friend once. Hold on, I gotta get a water. I had a friend once that uh, he was kind of smart. He was really good at with computers. And he was doing this thing called the Telephone Company. And he had, he worked for the telephone company for a while. He ended up breaking into uh, the AT&T and um, stealing all their manuals. And would- that guy would be a whole nother story. Yeah. So, he, but anyway, he he um, 
he did this trick once where he had his little orange phone. I don't know if you remember these. They had alligator clips. It was like the telephone guy would. I guess he stole it from the. Oh uh, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, he 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 took this and um, somebody was playing their stereo too loud in the house, so he went and went to the box outside and attached the two alligator clips to the phone and grabbed the power supply to the apartment building and turned the whole their apartment off. Maybe not the whole building, but maybe just the, and turned and said and they answered their phone and said, "Don't ever do that again," and then hung up the phone. That'd be kind of creepy. Yeah, no, somebody yeah. have that kind of power. No, you know, it's like Liam Neeson. Johnny yeah. tried to do that in one of the episodes. He tried it. We were watching the movie Tron, and they were playing music at the same time. And Johnny was trying to figure out how to unplug uh, their music. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, Taskmaster goes back to the early days when I could say uh, whatever I want on Facebook, and uh, uh, it's a stupid question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Some questions I can tell you, like that Matt's not going to have much of a. Well, I mean, I, I see the question you popped up there, and I don't really. <clears throat> the only thing I can say about that band is that the um, the guy played a twelve string bass, I think. That so did Tom Peterson play, play. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, I. Uh... That's all I know about them. I know nothing else except that the guy played a twelve string bass, and I think he played the whiskey a couple times. <clears throat> I don't know if we're debating on whether Debbie Gibson's hot or not. I, I am the final say. She is hot. Uh, she's 53, and she looks great. We should all hope uh, 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 to look that way when we're 53. Right, Matt? Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, a super sticker. I haven't seen one of these in, in, a, in a long time. <laughs> Frank, thank you so much for the super sticker. Uh, let's see. Sebastian seemed to be playing with air. He moved to play with air supply. Did I make up with him? So that's a good question. Uh, he did see him. Sebastian is the biggest music fan in the world. He knows every song, everybody. He's really into it. And yeah, I'm sure he loved singing with Air Supply. And he was good. I, I recorded it. Uh, if you're signed up to be a member of the channel, you can watch it. That's how the other way I get around copyright. Members only. Uh, members only like the jacket. I think I he's very good. I have to say, I saw, I, the little I saw him, I, I don't not really a huge... <clears throat> Skid Row fans. I never saw Skid Row. I think I did once opening for Guns N' Roses, but I didn't really know their stuff. But <clears throat> I watched some things on YouTube of him on the cruise, and I thought he's very good with the 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 audience. Like he's he's a good com he's he connects to them very well. I felt I was shocked how good he was. He was very funny, yeah. and mm -hmm. he he and he played some really heavy music and <laughs> calmed these people down, <laughs> let them know that it's going to get loud. But uh, he, he was one of the highlights of the boat. Actually, him and Steven probably both were sort of for a lot of people. I mean, I saw a lot of things that I enjoyed. I like to see the smaller things. Someone asked if I went to see the movie Rad. I did. I went to see it last night. It was incredible. Uh, it was much better than I remembered in 1986. But the song Send Me an Angel is this really dumb dance scene on the bikes. It's very funny. And uh, I went to see those guys on the boat. And the singer will be on this show soon but yeah it, it was it was i thought it was a fun cruise somebody asked if i like mark's bass amps <clears throat> i will say this <clears throat> they're very light the cabinets have you picked one of these up i was able my skinny self was able to lift that thing up at the whiskey once with two hands up on that stage which is about oh, yeah yeah <clears throat> and i was able to do that now the way they said i wasn't really a fan of the way it sounded but I would think that, that I do like that the, the how light it was. I use a thing called the Fender Rumble. Have you seen this? Heard about it. It's light. <clears throat> it's as light as they come, but it's a it's a decent sized bass. But it is light and it has a good a, a good tone and mm. uh, a good sound. You know, I'm not a crazy with bass. To me, if it goes boom, I'm happy. <laughs> but I, 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 uh, I mean, I, I think everything should be an Ampeg SVT, you know, but it's it, you can't carry that around, you know what I mean? No. I don't oh, that thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm trying to... Someone says that Sebastian Bach had the videos removed from his channel. I think you're mistaken. I think Skid Row did it because <clears throat> if you have songs up, Skid Row controls the copyright, not Sebastian. And I had uh. some... I snuck around some of it, but not all of it. Uh, 
And let's see, and we'll wrap this up in just a second so Matt can go have a, his life and uh, and I can have, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just skimming. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul. <laughs> Why? Dr. Yeah. <laughs> because I had something in my throat and I'm trying to <clears throat> get it out. Does it drive you crazy who, who Dr. Paul is, Matt? Uh, yeah. You feel like you're closer to solving it? You know, I think there's the guy. I think I know who he is, but I would assume that nothing against Dr. Paul. The reason I don't think it's the guy I think it is is because I think the guy I think it is should be dead. So I'm shocked. What if it's Paul and all of a sudden Paul has a sense of humor? It's not, uh, not, it's not the right kind of sense of humor. No. And Paul, right, that's true. Paul's very funny, but that is it. Yeah. Yeah, this is not. Uh, although I gotta no. have Paul on, he wanted to come back. Uh, um, Mal Gal enjoyed Ray Parker Jr. He was very enjoyable. People think of him only for Ghostbusters, but he was in a band called Radio R A Y D I O, and he plays guitar. He's a guitar player. He's got a good band. Uh, yeah, there's a there was a lot to see. Uh, all right, Traveler of Thailand says uh, thanks. He's been on here a lot. Yeah, good stuff. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, he, they want to see you without Johnny over talking. That's what he's saying in a nice way. Wow. Johnny's funny. I'm scared Johnny's not going to be on my side of the stage. <laughs> well, I don't think we can even comment. Yeah. <laughs> There's, I, I wish I had a cough button where I could <clears throat> turn it off. But yeah, no, Johnny and you are good company. Uh, God forbid. Yeah, I like Johnny. I like, I like Johnny. I like standing next to him. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, this no right here. Is is why we're here. This is uh, Matt Thorne's solo uh, uh, CD, his first solo CD. It, it, it's uh, available uh, right now on uh, my Shopify, and you can get one, and he'll sign it to you. And uh, and then, again, he has some cool uh, picture picks, too. The record's called you know, Back to Funk Up, and uh, very cool. You can pick one up, show us some support, let him know that I sent you. Uh, oh, hold on. And here's Michael Perez. Thank you uh, for uh, the super chat, super sticker. Uh, I appreciate it. We did a whole week, Monday through Friday, every day at 5 p.m. I've uh, This is what I've learned from this, Matt. I would do this more often, uh, it, one, if I can get a producer or something. I got away from Michelle to graduate law school. But uh, she was supposed to be here moderating, but she took a nap, which means she's still asleep. Um, but if I, it, it's How hard to do this alone. Michelle? Say it again? How do you moderate? What do you do on the? You just you get like a you get you get a button, and then you have access to kick out dummies, basically. Oh, and you have a handy. Let me know if you need another gig, uh, but it, it's yeah. You just watch the chat, and uh, but I'm I'm handling it by myself right now. I've only put two people in timeout the entire time uh, we've been here, which is over two hours. Hard to believe. Uh, but anyway, this week we did different things every day. On Monday, Johnny came by. Every show was just one hour. On Tuesday, we played which decade had the best candy. And uh, Johnny, my friend Jay, and Michelle were there. On Wednesday, Wednesday 13 was here. On Thursday, which was yesterday, uh, Sean Clark was here from Horrors Hollowed Grounds. And uh, he was great. And then today, Matt closing out the week, two hours. We'll be back Monday morning with a, uh, a, a the tour diary that's missing. I'm going to show some of these nice comments. Somebody asked if I liked Aruba, and I wish I would have stayed in Aruba or stayed on the cruise. I I, I wish we would have stayed longer in Aruba. Aruba is really cool. Yeah. I think for, for, for Matt, I think another day in Aruba would have been great. I think the cruise was enough. You know, Matt, you pointed out you've been on nine cruises before. And you and your wife, um, you weren't going to go to so many of those shows. You saw a few. It, it wasn't, it's very different than Monsters of Rock. I, it, in some ways, I prefer the cruising ad thing of it. I was ready to do another 10 days. Michelle and I liked having no responsibility, loafing around, walking the stairs every day, eating whatever they give you. We would just go to the dining room and just eat whatever. And uh, so we liked the experience, but I think... Um, I think for Matt, who's done a million cruises, I think Aruba would have been good. This is nice here. Uh, have you ever thought about getting a new cat? Um, I think about it from time to time. Uh, I'd like to. I, 
Uh, luckily, there's no cats around here. I would just adopt one right out of the street. Usually, my cats have found me. But uh, so far, because of our tour schedule and because I'm still sort of upset, uh, I'm going to wait yeah. a while. And when I'm able to be home, I'll have a cat. The problem with the, these animals, they're not – I always thought it was kind of a, a bad thing where a – God gave us these tortoises that live 150 years, and then we have this wonderful dogs and cats that don't even make it to 20. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like I, 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 who wants a tortoise? You know, so I don't understand. Yeah, I uh, I agree, and I'm I'm kind of thinking. I told Michelle, I think uh, uh, the next pet we have probably outlives me. I'll probably drop dead before the pet, and so I'm set. She could just deal with it, like most things. <laughs> You know, um, okay, hold on. Now I want to let's see. Uh, a lot of people love the show. A lot, uh, a lot of people. I wish uh, Matt was a permanent sidekick for the show. Mitch says loves when Matt is on. A lot of uh, oh, Matt fans. Doctor Paul thinks you're a tortoise racist. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you that oh. in the in the next video, day seven and eight, I go to Gator World, Gator Land. It's in Orlando, Florida. And when I got there, I tell the camera, I point out, Matt is the one who taught me. Alligators, you'll, you're fine. But a <laughs> crocodile, you, you're, you're screwed. You're, you're screwed. And we and, now you, had, you never showed this whole documentary we did on the aquarium in uh, Baltimore, did you? Hasn't come out yet. It's coming. Hold oh, on. I got to say thank you. That, I, thank I, you I, mean, David. I knew all the animals there. I mean, especially the, the some of the poison arrow frogs and the fish. I was shocked. Hold on, Matt. I want to say thank you to David R. for the super chat. It definitely helps to keep this going and motivate me to sit here every day and then bother my friends to do it as well. Uh, we, yes, in an upcoming episode, Matt and I visit an aquarium. We meet a, a sloth. We learn about different animals. Uh, that's a good one. It's coming soon. Uh, but uh, I, did, I did follow your advice about alligators and crocodiles. And the people there did say if, a, if you, you can outrun an alligator. Alligators are fast, but they give up very fast. They will not chase you for a long distance. So if you can run fast enough, but they said, don't mess around with the crocodile. They'll come after you and, and they'll get you. And they, they said, won't. don't yeah, try the right. zigzag bullshit. Crocodiles are onto that. And they will and you've you. seen these tigers get in fights with, with crocodiles. And the mm -hmm. crocodile wins and anacondas. I mean, you got to, the, the, the crocodile win an anaconda, the crocodile win a, very rarely does the crocodile end on the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's usually the winner of the fight. So, yeah, you don't, and, and us, you know, these, us humanoids, we, we, we can't, human sap, homo sapiens, or whatever that we are, you can't win. We don't have no, we have nothing. We can't run. We can't scratch. We can't bite. It's, you're done. Yeah, uh, a lot of people saying Matt doesn't get much anti-comment, only decent questions. People love him. It is true. Matt is sort of uh, uh, cherished <laughs> here. And this show is so funny because from day to day, it's a completely different show. I think that's one of the things that keeps my mind going. Otherwise, I'd probably be bored. But every conversation has been different. Every personality has been different. I certainly consider myself fortunate to travel with the guys that I uh, uh, do, uh, most of them, but because it's, uh, it is nice to have people who have common things and who are, are polite and aren't trying to pull rock star bullshit. Uh, we're all too old for that. You know? My favorites is when you have Steven on. <laughs> yeah, That's it's my always favorite. interesting. It's how, those are my best because the, sometimes the equipment doesn't work properly. And th just that in itself is entertaining. He, I never know what he's up to ever. I don't. One time he had a big plan to come on. He stayed thirty seconds. I remember I had to go uh, get get you afterwards to help me talk. Yeah, he. You, you never know. I haven't talked to him too much lately, but he's up to big things. And there's, I will say, I, I, I'll tease it. There's big things ahead um, that you're going to be excited about. You're going to want to come to the shows in Texas. Um, you're gonna, you're there, there's some new stuff. That I can't say anything. I'm not, a, not at liberty to say, but uh, that's going to be big. And then go to see everywhere else we're going to be. Sparks, Nevada uh, is coming up. I don't know if that's announced, but uh, is that a I'm Skid Row one? Is that a Skid Row one? It's Skid Row. Uh -huh. And there's a next night somewhere in California, maybe near Sacramento, maybe. 
Hmm. I think tickets are on sale for that. Uh, Toledo, Ohio, Vixen, Stephen Adler, uh, Slaughter, Great White, Stephen Piercy. So there's a lot of uh, fun things uh, uh, ahead, and there'll be a lot more to talk about. And uh, thank you, Matt, for spending some time. And hopefully I'll be back in Burbank soon. And uh, you and I and Michelle and uh, Wednesday, uh, uh, we'll all get together and uh, go for BJ. Oh, I, I got to tell you, I, I went on this hike and um, I, there was a part of Burbank I didn't know existed. And it's up in these hills here. And uh, Ramel and I went on the hike. We saw some rattlesnakes. But on the way back, we thought of you because there was this golf club but not a golf club not the actual club a club that you have to you remember but it's a clubhouse i should call it anyway it's open to the public and it was really cool anyway we should go there yes okay that sounds good they, they serve food i'm assuming they serve food and um uh, there are really nice people there and there wasn't that many people there and it's up on this nice property and it was I didn't they, know uh, it. Yeah. you never remember yet? Huh? Have, they have they integrated yet or are they working on it? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so anyway, but yeah, if you want to see Matt come back, then the best way to do it is to buy one of his CDs. This is well, the they best have one. been. They have been. I got all these Shopify notifications. I have to go to the uh, post office now. Yeah, the Burbank post office is going uh, uh, to be seeing Matt tomorrow. Uh, I'll answer this question for Matt. What is Matt's favorite food? Matt's favorite food... Uh, I mean, what he eats the most, I don't know if it's favorite, would be salmon. He, he can, you can always trust him to order the salmon. Yep. Uh, is that, would you call that your favorite food, though? Yeah, although I did see a uh, documentary on food the other day that kind of made me second think the salmon thing. There's, there's some fat in it that I didn't realize in these, in these uh, farm-raised salmons that I didn't realize I was, I was eating, and it was kind of disgusted me and this happened to me once in the 90s where i watched a tv show a documentary on cows and how they uh are urinating and de defecating on the land and it's running into the water supply and then they drink the water so i didn't eat i didn't eat hamburgers for 10 years i didn't i wouldn't eat red meat for 10 years because of that because of that documentary so i, I i'm hoping the salmon documentary doesn't affect my issue with salmon but i have to, i have to say i have had a little less salmon lately and i've been eating trout did the vander sloot documentary maybe sway you from inviting women onto the beach and hitting them with cinder blocks or oh, I, I you know i'm i'm not so sure i buy into his whole cinder block thing i think you might be correct because I think anything uh, he says i didn't see any cinder blocks you know this was years ago but I mean, when I was there, there was no cinder block in sight. I don't know maybe where. He, maybe he brings it's amazing his own. to me that you're gonna you're gonna lie down on the beach with somebody, and there happens to be this 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 weapon next to you that you can use to kill the person. Yeah, maybe he strangled her. The whole thing is sad. Yeah. Uh, somebody asks if, if there's a Mrs. Thorne, and of course there's a Mrs. Oh, Thorne. Yeah. She's been on the show before, mm -hmm. and uh, she she is uh, Matt and his lovely wife Ramel picked out this jacket. This is my favorite jacket now. And, yeah, we went uh, shopping. Oh, yeah, we looks, went, your your outfits look great, by the way. I think that did you. help. And and you and you really didn't have. She's very good at getting you to buy things that aren't a million dollars. Although if you go to you know she 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 can't, if you're in the Gucci store you might get a little robbed. Yeah, but I wasn't go, I wasn't going. You didn't there. go there. But she's really good at uh, you know moderately priced clothes that can make you look good. Matt's wife is the costume designer on Grey's Anatomy. So obviously she, and plenty of other TV movie projects. So she has a good eye for it. And she definitely knows how to mix things up. And the, I didn't pass on one thing. There was like one or two items that I said, I don't know if this is me, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to, because it's better to try things. Yep. Now you walked past the Gucci store in Aruba, you and Michelle. I don't know if you know oh, that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You could have went oh, in there and here. Saw, you know, maybe a couple thousand dollars on a wallet. Look who's here, uh, Matt. Uh, high low herself. Uh, Gucci oh, to target. She yeah. And she is. she is the master of the high low. He taught <laughs> uh, Matt taught me. Uh, you, can we? Can you explain high low? High low is when you wear Amazon T-shirts or uh, Uniqlo 
as we went to unique low t-shirts worth like seven dollars and then you have wearing one the, the dolce cabana uh shoe that goes along with everything that costs you you know an arm and leg that's that's high low yeah you mix you take an expensive item and maybe a not so expensive item you make a good affordable outfit rather than an outfit that would uh yeah. Someone says she dresses McDreamy and Jason but, and Matt, but yeah. uh, McDreamy hasn't been around in a little while, but she, she def definitely is great at what, uh, what she does. Uh, does Matt autograph the CDs before shipping? I believe yes. so, right? Yep, everyone. So yep. if you want your name on it, yeah, that's another question. Uh, will, will it be, will he personalize it? Uh, yes. I would if somebody asked me that in the Shopify uh, comments or even an email. I think you, usually I get an email and the person says, can you do this? And I will do it. Right. So that's, uh, that's the answer on that. Hey, I've had a great time. You know, sometimes these shows yep. start a little slow. We've carried 250 people for two hours and uh, great conversation. I'm always happy to have you here. Uh, if some yeah. everyone wants to talk to Mrs. Thorne Thor now, and uh, she can, never, have, she can Mrs. have her own show. Mrs. Thorne gets home from work, and she immediately goes horizontal. Immediately, yes. it's bed horizontal. She's you won't see her vertical probably unless she needs to eat or pee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, all right. Everyone's got nice words. It, it's been a very positive conversation. Matt, I'm going to see you uh, most likely in Texas next. I don't know if I'll be out there, but we'll okay. get together soon. I appreciate you being here. For everyone watching, Monday we'll be back, 10 a.m. tour diary. Wednesday uh, we'll do a live show. Friday um, I'm going to put out a, a new interview. There's a Mark Goodman from MTV, the original MTV VJ, is going to be on the show. I'm excited to uh, have him on. Uh, uh, a, a member of the Karate Kid cast is going to be here. I don't know if I froze now. It looks like I did. But uh, anyway, I'm going to get out of here because it looks like it's frozen. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. All right, bud. Okay. See you next. Thank you, everyone. Make sure you like this video, comment on it, uh, subscribe on it. I don't know how to get out of here. I don't either. I'm, I'm just going to. I wish you could end this thing, Matt. Uh, yeah, I guess I could leave studio. Done. Yeah. All right. I'll try that, too. <laughs> All right, goodbye, everybody. Well, now it's just me. I apologize that we, we just went so long. And it's not a flattering picture of me either. <laughs>